As a developer, you need to deliver fast and you simply don't have the time to constantly think about security. Neuralegion can help. We give you, the developer, comprehensive and fast security testing automation for your entire application on every pull request. With every new pull request, Nextploit will run all the security tests your app needs without false positives. We can integrate directly with your CI, CD pipelines, whatever your environment. So what are you waiting for? Add Nextploit to your project and start doing unit security testing today. Alrighty, hi everyone. My name is Paul and I'm going to be your host for the next two and a half, I guess, or maybe even three hours. Depends on how long would our Q&A session talk, take. And yes, thank you everyone for joining us for this amazing event. And thank you to our sponsors, to our amazing sponsors, to those who supported this whole event, supported this community throughout the preparation. And um uh, and uh, could you please give me a quick feedback if if my sound is okay or uh, I'm not lagging or anything? Okay, awesome, awesome. So um, just a quick introduction about our sponsors because this block we're going to have a speaker from one of our sponsors from JFrog. And uh, thanks again to JFrog. Thank you for the support of this event, for your awesome product, and also for... Uh, actually providing us with uh, with a top-notch speaker. So uh, Stephen will be the next speaker after Amazing Amber. And I'm adding Amber Thunderberg to this stream. Hi, Amber. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing great. Thank you. Excited for uh, such a great group of people who joined us to actually share some amazing talks, uh, some amazing topics and discuss very important things because sometimes we actually, we, we miss the thing that uh, the DevOps, it's also about the operation. So it's not only about dev and you actually need to cultivate a culture of creativity as, as the name of your talk says, the collaboration and captainship because sometimes uh, I know this, from my own site projects, like the, the companies that I used to work for, when uh, the the DevOps they they uh, they used to think about themselves as just the sysadmins. They just mm -hmm. administrate stuff. They just push. They just merge. And <laughs> they they just do the pull requests, and that's it. And uh, yeah, so thank you for this awesome talk, and thank you for what you do at uh, Pathways Group. And we're excited to welcome you. And I guess without any further ado, I'll let you introduce your talk and let you take the floor. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. That was a wonderful to meet you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I am so glad to be here. As stated before, my name is Amber Vandenberg with the Pathways Group. And a few years ago, I actually had the opportunity to quit my job in corporate America. And I became the only American, the only female, and the only blonde academy football coach or soccer coach for the Adidas Game Day Academy and Paris Saint-Germain PSG Academy in Bangalore, India, to coach widely the first generation of athletes on both an elite and a grassroots level. Now, whenever I joined the academy, I discovered that our teams were operator, operating under a very strict command and obey dynamic. Oftentimes, our players within our training would come to a session and they would stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for Okay, here we are. I apologize. Had a bit of a, <laughs> I apologize. Looks like the internet went out for a moment, uh, but I'm back. So uh, and while this may be an efficient way to teach a skill in a game scenario, it was a disaster. Oftentimes our players within the course of a match would kick the ball perfectly, exactly the way that we taught them. 
And then before the play was even over, they would turn to the sideline to the coach. I apologize. Uh, uh, I apologize there. Uh, it looks looks like we're having a bit of connection issues today, but I'm going to try and be, um, we're going to try and work through it. So I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, as I said, our players, they had mastered the task, but they didn't quite understand how it applied to the overall game scenario. And so we found that we could transform our academy from lines and laps and lectures to one of more creativity, collaboration, and captainship by adjusting our focus, adjusting our communication, and making slight pivots in our way of work. And the first thing that we had to do was stop. And start clearly communicating the what and the why. Stop commanding the how and start clearly communicating your what and your why. Your what and your why. In application, it looked a little something like this. Rather than stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for instruction, we provided challenges. So from here, kick the ball to knock down those three cones. Because in order to do that, you're going to have to kick with power and precision. And in a game scenario, whenever you pass, whenever you kick, whenever you shoot, you're also going to have to kick with power and precision. From challenges like these, I saw some of the most heated debates I'd ever seen amongst seven-year-olds trying to decide if the best way to kick the ball was with the infant or with the laces. In reality, both ways were right. And so we were able to expand our toolbox of resources and toolbox of skills that we could use to be successful. Every day within your team, you have an opportunity to expand or limit your toolbox of resources based off of your communication. And we do that by clearly communicating our what and our why. Now, some of you might be hearing this and be reminded of a popular TED talk and popular book called Start With Why. For those of you who haven't seen the 12 minute Simon Sinek TED talk, uh, allow me to save you about 12 minutes. See, Simon Sinek has this idea of the golden circle. He writes that too often times companies know what they do. Nearly everyone knows what they do. Even my, uh, even my youngest players, they knew that they were kicking the ball but we focus on what to do and how to do it. But don't focus, don't start with why. Cynic inspires us to start with why. Start at the core, start at your purpose. Why are we actually doing this? What is the goal? All right, we're starting with that, we're starting with that purpose, starting with that vision. Um, and then we of course are going to clarify the expectations within the what. But as I look at this golden circle, many times we focus on this what and this why. These are the opportunities for you as a leader within your team to, uh, there are opportunities for you to clarify your why and your what. But it's this opportunity within the how that you have an opportunity to be uniquely better. This why and this what will most, in the most part, be your handrails. They'll be the guardrails. But you have so much elasticity, so much flexibility within the how to establish your competitive advantage. See, I work with companies and work with teams all over the world. And, and I think about specific industries. For example, uh, I look at healthcare industries. Nearly every healthcare organization I've worked with has some sort of why in that they want to help people live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, they want to uh, help communities live a healthy lifestyle. They want to help their patients. And they do that through healthcare practices. Uh, and the, the what is healthcare practices. And there's a lot of healthcare industries that have a similar why. I look at higher education. Nearly every higher education institution that we've worked with has some sort of why of helping students be successful in life. 
And I have to wonder if all healthcare uh, organizations and if all uh, higher education institutions, and even if all of the different teams that I coached, I've coached about uh, about 25 different teams, um, sports teams over the years, we all have similar whys. But not all are equally successful. See, we start with why. We do not end with why. So we have to start with why. This is going to determine our direction. It's going to determine our focus, determine our vision. But it's this opportunity within the how. How are you working towards your why that you are going to establish your competitive advantage? This is how you're going to uh, really establish your opportunities to be uniquely better. And it's an opportunity for ownership within your team. Now, there are actually four major opportunities within your how. So you might say, Amber, okay, we've established our why. We know our vision. We know where we're going. We know our purpose. Now, what do you mean whenever you say move on to the question of how? How are we going to establish your competitive advantage? There are four major opportunities for ownership within your, uh, within your teams. The first is within your processes. Next is within your methods, then your projects and your roles. These are the four major opportunities for ownership within your team. Now, your processes. Uh, think about whenever you are recruiting your new team members. Think about your interview process versus your interviewing methods, right? These are slightly different. The process is the many steps in the process of getting hired, but the interview method is a one step. Uh, look at the way that you are developing product, right? What is your process? Uh, is it more... Um, is it more agile? Is it more waterfall? What, what is the overall process? What are the methods that you're using in your retrospective, right? How are you communicating within your team? Look at the projects that you are taking on. Now, keep in mind, all of these should be reiterated in your why. We started with why. The projects that you take on, both on a micro and a macro level, should reiterate those values, reiterate the culture that you have within your team. I'll give you an example uh, with a healthcare company. Uh, they wanted a why of helping communities live a more healthy lifestyle. A project that they took on was every year they hosted a massive bicycle race for the community. This is a way that they could encourage healthy lifestyles within their community. So look at the projects that you're taking on. Uh, I was working with we work with a lot of tech companies. Uh, I was working with one tech company that they had a why of helping their communities have more access to technology. And so they partnered with their schools and they engaged in after school programs to help the students have more access to technology. Here were projects. Now, a project can be anything that has a beginning and an end, right? So anything that has a beginning and an end, that can be defined as a project in this context. And then lastly, look at your opportunities for ownership within your roles, All right? So uh, I've had some team members ask, they go, well, what if, what if we don't, uh, what if we don't have a scrum master who's going to, uh, what if we don't have um, many people in quality control, uh, who's going to uh, take over those roles? Well, the position may not be here, but the role is still here, right? So who's going to uh, be the person that can help with uh, quality control that can help um, uh, that can help the quality and help the uh, process within your development. So a role is not necessarily a position, though it can be. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was working with one team. Uh, it was a development team, and there was a person within the team that their role was to be the questioner. They were the devil's advocate. Now this was a role that was. Um, that the person took on and everyone really appreciated that, uh, that role that they had within the team. Now, typically it doesn't say in the job description, be the devil's advocate, be the person that is questioning everything, but that was the value. And that was the role that the person had within the organization and within the team. You can expand role multiple layers. So you can look at your individual role that you have within the team. 
You can look at the role that your team has within the organization. You can also look at the role that your organization has within the community as a whole. Either way, whenever you are looking for opportunities for ownership, I encourage you to start with these four major approaches. This is your opportunity to be There you go. You can see me now. <laughs> um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. I want to make sure every Amber is having some connection, but it seems like everything's okay now. All right, we have connection issues now. Uh, now the question is, what does this have to do with creativity thing on the what and the how? Then our focus is on the commander, on the person that is um on the person that is uh, commanding those goals. If we're focusing on the why, then our focus is not necessarily on the commander. It's on the actual goal. Our source of creativity is widely influenced by our focus. Focusing on the commander, then my opportunity for ownership uh, it can be very small because the commander is the person that is dictating the processes, the roles, the projects, and the methods. If my focus is on the goal, this is this is why people will kick the ball and then look to the coach. In your team, if there is a challenge, is your team looking towards the boss or are they looking towards the goal? Furthermore, there is not always, many times, there's not just one way to improve, right? We're looking at this in CICD, right? There's more than just one way to improve. There's not just one right way to kick the ball. There are many ways. And by creating this guardrail of our there it goes. Uh, creativity is widely influenced by our focus area. I want to pause there for just a moment to see if you have any questions about these opportunities for ownership that you can provide within your team. Okay. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, we are not commanding the how, we are clarifying this what and this why, and we're providing very specific opportunities for ownership to be uniquely better within the how, within our processes, methods, projects, and roles. Go ahead and put this up on the board for us. Whenever we implemented this concept and we implemented these new practices within our team, naturally, we had more discussion. We had uh, more opportunities for conversation. See, an opportunity for ownership is an opportunity for more conflict, but it's also an opportunity for conversation over complacency. I'll say that again. With an opportunity for ownership comes more opportunity for conflict, but it's also an opportunity for conversation over complacency. See, within our team, now there were more than just one way to kick the ball. There were at least two. Naturally, with this more discussion, <laughs> more conflict, different ideas, it felt like it exposed something that was wrong. Beforehand, we didn't have as much conflict. We didn't have as much conflicting conversation. And we didn't want to create an opportunity for uh, more conflict with many ideas and not equip our team to have these conversations in a meaningful way. So we shifted our focus from the coach to the goal. Now we had to engage in true collaboration. And we started with having proactive conversations. Now, proactive conversations is a quick activity that I do whenever I'm starting a new project, 
whenever I'm working with a new team, whenever we're taking on a new client. And a proactive conversation goes a little something like this. At some point in our working relationship, there's going to be conflict. At some point in our working relationship, there may be tension. There may be frustration. I may fail you. And so while the emotions are low now, let us proactively discuss how we are going to handle that situation whenever it inevitably arises. This is a proactive conversation. Now, I, I encourage proactive conversations to be catered, to be very specific. Uh, within some teams, we may use personality tests. Uh, we may uh, go through a series of activities to identify specific areas where there may be frustration in the future. Here, we're able to be extremely catered. I was working with one team that they had done a few projects before and they recognized and knew that there were some people on the team that were very detailed and asked a lot of questions and sometimes would get in a rut of asking, of engaging in circular conversation. There were also other people in the team that were not very detail oriented. We needed the detailed people to ask a lot of questions, but there were other people on the team that were very action focused. They wanted to move very quickly within the conversation. This could provide an opportunity for some conflict. And so we recognized this and had a proactive conversation and we actually time boxed our conversations. We called them Elmo times, which stood for enough. Let's move on Elmo. <laughs> and so uh, we actually had a person on the team that would allocate time for meaningful discussion. We needed that time, but we also needed time to say enough. We've had conversation. Let's make a decision and let's move on. Here, we're able to have a proactive conversation. This is much more specific than, hey, we recognize that there may be conflict. If that happens, bring it up. No, no, no. We actually got very, very specific. Um, in in another team, uh, it was a different uh, dev dev team, and there was a person that uh, that would sometimes get a bit uh, a um. Uh, overpower other people, uh, so to speak, very loudly and overpower people. And so rather than having to bring it up and have a full discussion every time, we recognize that from the beginning, uh, the person recognized it. And so we came up with a code word, which was pinnacle. <laughs> Whenever that started happening, it meant, hey, let's calm down, let some other people speak, right? We want more conversation. And the person really appreciated that and was able to uh, improve. And it actually helped us to work in a more harmonious environment. These are quick examples of how we were operating better as a team. And we did this through proactive conversations. Sometimes people are hesitant to bring up conflict or bring up frustrations because uh, there is how the situation will be handled. And sometimes people are hesitant to bring up frustrations as a whole. By having a proactive conversation, you say that not only uh, is frustration expected, but we actually have a game plan on how we're going to handle that situation. And this helps to alleviate one of the greatest hurdles to uh, collaborating effectively within a team, especially if you have a lot of different ideas. And that is the fundamental attribution error. Now, the fundamental attribution error is really just a fancy way of saying that too often times we judge other people by their outcomes, by their actions, by their behaviors, while we judge ourselves by our intentions. Surely we've never seen this in different dev teams that we've worked with. If someone makes a mistake, uh, we see this sometimes whenever we're driving down the road, uh, somebody cuts us off and clearly they're a horrible driver. They, uh, they weren't paying attention. We need to take their keys and we need to get them off the road. But if we cut somebody off, we didn't intend to cut someone off. We didn't see that the lane change was coming and we start looking at our intentions. I was working with one team and the team member said, Amber, we dread 
this certain person coming to our collaboration meetings. He is abrasive. He is, um, he, he's very abrasive. He's very direct. He's some even said malicious. And so I went and I talked to the person. I asked, okay, keeping the fundamental attribution error in mind, what is your intention whenever you are speaking at meetings? We found that he was not intending to be abrupt or abrasive. He was intending to be passionate, intending to be persuasive. And so there was a gap between the intended behavior and the perceived behavior. And so by asking for intention first, we were able to bring the two closer together. Whenever you're collaborating within your team, we, uh, you should establish a full value contract, assume positive intent, or ask for intent. Either way, some teams uh, word that a little bit differently. But either way, look at the fundamental attribution error within your, uh, within your collaboration. So the first thing that we did is we adjusted focus from focusing on the commander and pleasing the commander to focusing on the goal. We did that by clearly communicating that what and that why and providing opportunities for ownership within the how. Then we adjusted the focus once more. Whenever we stop just there, then the opportunity for ownership and the focus is generally on your individual opportunities for ownership. People may be focusing on the scorecard, on their task, but we wanted to make the adjustment from the scorecard to the scoreboard. This is where we increase this collaboration and we're asking many people to uh, contribute their ideas. If you want to achieve something bigger than yourself, then you're going to have to include more than yourself within your team. I see if you can achieve your dreams all on your own, then you're probably not dreaming big enough. We needed to equip our team to collaborate in an effective and healthy way. But our transition was not yet complete. The last step within our uh, transformation was to equip people in leadership positions to help uh, progress the team even further. Now, at the very beginning, whenever we were under a command and obey dynamic, I would have players come up and ask, Miss Ember, I want to be captain today. And my answer was, of course, you can be captain if you can tell me what the job of a captain is. Now, under a command and obey dynamic, there is this notion that if you obey and obey and obey and obey long enough, then eventually you get to be the commander. And so it was a cycle within the leadership. And so we did something dramatic within our team. We actually took away the position of captainship for a few months so that we could focus on a few other things and then reintroduced it. And during those few months, we actually started defining what a leader was, what a captain was within our team of helping to serve others of helping to lead the team. And so we trained the character of our leaders first. And then whenever we reintroduced the position, we were able to focus more on uh, more on the technical skills. So what to do during a, co a coin flip and things of that sort uh, within the captainship role. Whether it's Captain America, Captain Underpants, or Captain Crunch, captainship can be uh, defined a little bit differently depending on uh, depending on your organization. So you need to define what captainship or what leadership means within your team, train the character, and then you can train for the position within your team. Now, we have discussed a lot of different ideas today. I know that my time is coming to an end, so I want to leave you with one final story. We've learned a lot of different words today. Hopefully you've gained some tools that you can implement within your team. Sometimes whenever we learn a lot of new concepts and a, and a lot of new words, and sometimes whenever I talk to organizations, I'm reminded of one of my youngest players that I coached. He was six years old and his name was Achintia. Now Achintia was so excited for his very first day of football. On his first day, he came running out onto the field and he began yelling, pass, pass, pass. Now, I noticed that Achintia was yelling pass even whenever the other team had the ball. 
and I noticed that Achynthia was yelling past even whenever he was miles away from the action. And I noticed that Achynthia was yelling pass even whenever he had the ball. So then he was running with the ball going, pass, pass, pass. And so I looked at Achynthia and I said, Achynthia, why are you yelling pass? And he looked up at me and he said, Miss Amber, I do not know what it means. I only know it is a football word. Sometimes I hear organizations sound a little bit like my friend Achynthia. Yelling, leadership, teamwork, communication, collaboration, creativity, we got this. Because we know that these are really good words that can lead to big goals. But if we are in the wrong position, if we're miles away from the action, or even if we have the ball and we don't know in which direction we're going, then saying the word pass is not only ineffective, but it's actually detrimental to the overall communication within our team. Eventually, the team is going to tune you out. But if you first take the time to create an environment for true innovation within your team by clarifying that why and what and allowing opportunities for ownership within the how, within your processes, methods, projects, and roles, and if you take the time to create an environment for true, respectful, healthy collaboration within your team, and you equip leaders to continue to progress the team forward, then you'll be in a position to yell pass, to receive the ball, to move forward, and to score really big goals within your organization. I want to thank you all so much for having me here today. I'd love to connect and continue the conversation um, and I want to open it up right now for any questions that you may have. Amber, thank you for uh, for the presentation. And uh, we have the for this block, we have the format when we have the speakers and then we have the separate Q&A session. So if you don't mind, we will uh, we will join you shortly after this block. We will ask you to 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 join us and we will continue with the questions because we uh, we have some um tight uh arrangements with the uh with the schedule right now and we don't want to um we don't want to make other uh presenters wait so we'll continue with the questions because i see several so we'll continue with them right after the uh right after this block okay thank you very much thank you awesome And now let me introduce our uh, next speaker. Uh, we will have uh, Steven from JFrog, from our awesome sponsors, and he will be presenting on very, very interesting uh, topics. So the, the, the topic, the session uh, is named The Singularity is Here. Are your deployments ready? So we will have some really interested um I would say probably progressive, like in-depth thinking of what actually awaits for us. So the singularity is here and how we need to actually treat our production, how we need to treat our projects in order to not to lose the uh, the humanity, I would even say. So uh, welcome, Stephen. Hello, my name is Stephen Chin. I'm VP of Developer Relations at JFrog and very pleased to have you at my session to talk about the singularity is here and let's see if your let's see if your deployments are ready. Are you are you ready for the for the impending crisis? So, um kind of looking looking at the um at the, at the way which we're all um currently dealing with crises and pandemics. Um, you might think that the, the worst is over, but when you look at the progress of technology globally, we are on an escalating phase to where um, artificial intelligence and machines are quickly going to surpass human intelligence. And I think when you when you look at the progress of computer technology, um, you know, just in our lifespan, it's been tremendous going from, you know, early computers. My, my first computer was a, a Commodore VIC-20 where um, it greeted you with a basic prompt 
to what my kids currently use, which which are um, iPads and and iPhones and devices, which you know if, even if you want to program them, it's challenging. But you know, touchscreen UIs and the ability to to simply use computer technology has evolved, and those are hundreds of times more powerful than full size computers were um, just a few decades ago. So it's predicted that um, computer technology will surpass the brain power of um, has already surpassed the brain power of mice. It's going to surpass human brain power pretty soon, and we're quickly on to um, a trajectory where computers are going to be able to do everything which we can do. Okay, so this is great, but what what are the conditions? What's it going to take for us to get here? And um, I think that there is three basic conditions that we need to get to the singularity. Um, so the first one is having enough data to to model and simulate the world. Um, I, I think that um, this is already something which we're well on the way to um, to reaching, where there's 7.2 billion humans, 6.2 billion nucleotides. So basically, you can already store all of the information about um, humans. Um, 1 times 10 to the 19th bytes. The digital world as of 2020 had 6.8 times 10 to the 21st bytes of, of data. And if you look at all things on Earth, all creatures um, were up to 1.325 times 10 to the 37th. So we're well on our way to already hitting this condition of being able to simulate all the data. Um, the next big criteria is can we actually achieve the technological rate of advancement which we need to um, for computers to surpass our brain power, and this is already happening with some of the huge computing advances, like the the new um, Tensor Processing Unit version four that Google has. Um, they're up to one exaflop of computational power. Um, also, IBM recently unveiled a one twenty seven qubit quantum computer, which um, solves a whole bunch of problems, which. Um, previously were thought to be too complex in particular things that are NP complete or um, cryptographic problems or other things which which are quite challenging to solve with classic um, computing. So we're already on the way to achieving this with some of the advances in computer technology. And the the last condition is full automation of this technology. Can we can we actually build it? And I would argue that we're already on the way there with um, some of the advances in um, technology like this 3D printer, which can print itself. So it's a print 3D printer which prints 90% of the components that it needs to rebuild itself. And now, now the machines can build more machines. So the, um, they're complete. They're smarter than us. They can build themselves. And um, I think we're well on the way towards hitting these conditions of reaching the singularity. Um, okay, so before we get more into the session, I just want to do a quick announcement on a um, contest which we're going to be running. So um, you can enter to win a chance for a Nintendo Switch Lite. Um, and we have a great website where all the slides are posted. Um, we'll post the video once it's available. And um, also give me feedback as a presenter. Let us know how I'm doing. So. Um, you can enter a raffle to win a Nintendo Switch Lite. Um, it's only for folks who are in this session, so it's great that you guys are able to participate and came out to the session, so thanks a lot for joining us. Um, you, you have to enter ASAP. The winners will be selected in three business days, and then we'll contact you by email. So um, please, please, um, please take advantage of this, and also check out the slides and information. No need to take notes. Okay, so um, now that we've talked about the singularity and we've kind of um, we know where this is all where this is all headed, I would argue that we've we already knew about this decades ago, and this actually was predicted by um, the movie industry. So take a look at this. In the twenty first century, a weapon will be invented like no other. This weapon will be powerful, versatile, and indestructible. It can't be reasoned with. It can't be bargained with. It will feel no pity, no remorse, no pain, no fear. It will have only one purpose, to return to the present 
and prevent the future. This weapon will be called the Terminator. Okay, so as you can see, that's um, a, a classic Terminator film, and I, I think that um, clearly Arnold Schwarzenegger knew this was all coming with Skynet, so he 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 tried to warn us. Um, but if we want to actually see when this is going to happen, so I think you know, obviously you're plotting human intelligence, you're plotting machine intelligence, and we wanna we wanna try to predict when when is human intelligence going to surpass that of machines, and I I think that. Oh, yeah, this isn't quite right. Um, let me let me fix this slide a little bit. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so I, I think that we're we're clearly on the trajectory. I, I had to correct for um, recent events. I think the the human intelligence actually is decreasing quite a bit. Um, so you know, maybe around the year twenty forty is when we'll actually see this occur, where um, human intelligence will exceed that of machine intelligence, and we're actually going to reach the singularity. And um, just to just to take us there, um, so I have a cool little time machine, um, a la some of the later Terminator Terminator movies, which is going to take us to from the current date to to the year twenty forty. And let's see let's see what this is like. Let's see let's see where we're going. Okay, so the United Nations recognizes the first autonomous serverless life form. Okay, so this is this is exciting. This is exciting. We serverless technology fin finally finally caught on. It took long enough, um, so that's exciting that we're we're, we're recognizing our, our new overlords. Um, what else have we got? Oh, look! So you know, finally we're we're updating airplanes. I think that you know, IoT technology and updating stuff is is moving at rapid pace. Um, you know, it's a little scary to be updating cars and, and airplanes, but. This actually is the, the best way to keep yourself safe is to make sure that you're constantly updating, taking advantage of new security releases. And um, it looks like we're actually able to leverage that technology in, in airplanes and different in different vehicles. And um, oh, crop computing. Okay, so this is exciting. Um, so so apparently we've we figured out how to harness agriculture not just for producing energy, but for producing computational power. So um, I'm glad that it's not matrix S. We're 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 the crops. Uh, we're we're the computing power now. Now it's, they're going to use the. Um, they figured out how to genetically engineer it instead, which is exciting. So this is you know obviously this is a little um, you know tongue in cheek, but this actually is happening with the advance of IoT devices, where it's predicted that by the year 2025 there's going to be more than 30 billion IoT devices. Um, and you already see this today in everything which we're doing from. Um, you know, smart cars to smart TVs to your your cell phone or your refrigerator, or all the sorts of smart and connected devices which which you see and use in your daily life. And um, I think when when you're looking at um, kind of IoT advances and and where the world is headed, all of these devices they need software updates, they need new releases, and um, how how do we decide as consumers when when we're ready to update. So I think it's it's fairly straightforward. So we, if a new update's available, we decide, do we want it? And, you know, often, you know, if it has good functionality, yeah, of course we, we want the new functionality or we want our car to have autopilot or we want our phone to have a new app. So the next question is how, how risky is it? Is this something which um, actually is going to um, produce security risks or concerns for us? Um, so yeah, you really don't know. So you, you, do we trust it? And I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've had my fair share of software updates, which have basically, um, rendered a device or, or my computer inoperable. So maybe not. And then can you verify it? And that, that can also be challenging because it can often be costly. And then you end up in the, the dreaded red box. If you, if you had any, all of these no's, which is, can you, skip or for defer the update. And I, I know I've been up deferring the update on my phone for quite a while and none of this is good. Um, the, our machine overlords are not happy with how this is going because in, in the, um, in the assembly line of trying to ship software and trying to, to update, we are the, the bottleneck and constraints. Um, so, you know, us 
um, manually making decisions about updates, manually doing verifications, and um, trying to, to to make decisions about this as consumers also translates into the into the enterprise world, where um, if you don't have the right level of automation, if you don't have the right level of testing, verification, and security updates, you can't be efficient. You can't be effective um, at um, continuously releasing, updating, and making sure that we have a steady stream of new innovation. So the, the way to solve this is to um, implement a continuous delivery DevOps pipeline um, using your choice of CI server and um, having quality stages where at each of the different quality stages you promote your build. Um, so a great way to do this is to use a package manager like Artifactory where you check in your deployments and releases and then you deploy to different systems like a, an integration system a system testing system, a staging, a production system. And at each of these, you have different quality gates that have to be met um, for you need to pass to the next phase. So this kind of guarantees levels of quality as you're moving through the process. Um, you're pushing exactly the same bits because you have your release checked into a package management system. And um, this streamlines the process of making sure that we're not the bottleneck in the process and that we can fast track from is an update available to, of course, it's it's well tested, it's gone through all our quality gates, uh, we're sure that we're deploying the right code, and we can automatically make the update for the consumer, which um, increasingly what's happening on devices, you, you often don't even get a choice about whether you wanna update because um, the company which is pushing the software has done all the costly verification for you and made sure that the update you're, you're getting um, doesn't impact your functionality. So um, in doing this, what we're doing is we're essentially reversing the man-machine ratio. So rather than having a bunch of people um, controlling a machine and you know making sure a machine's running smoothly, now um, as an operator, you're able to efficiently program, code, maintain, observe systems, and get a large number of machines and devices operating efficiently with the least amount of human intervention as possible. And, our machine overlords are very happy with the situation. And um, this is um, steady employment for, for all of us highly technical geeks entering into the, um, the singularity. Um, now, I think one of the other big challenges is the singularity and um, you know, the, the, none of the, none of the sci-fi stories about when the computers take over have ever have a happy ending. And um, the kind of the dark cloud in all of this is security vulnerabilities. Um, and I think it's, it's very analogous to, to oil spills where the, the cost and the risk of having a security vulnerability um, greatly outweighs um, a, a lot of the, basically the, 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 the investment you would make to prevent security vulnerabilities as a company. So it's super critical that we're all taking advantage and, and making sure that we're, we're not introducing security vulnerabilities into our code. A classic example of a security vulnerability which um, impacted the whole industry was the Equifax data breach. Um, so this was caused by an Apache Struts vulnerability. Um, it took a couple months to fix it and caused a tremendous amount of, da of damage. So 1.4 billion in cleanup costs, 1.38 billion in consumer claims, um, affected 143 million consumers in the US. And um, this this um, defect, even though it's been a few years now, still exists, is still in live systems. And um, you know, this is this is why we need security scanners like um, JFrog X-ray, which will identify, um, find vulnerabilities and help us to mitigate these in production because you wanna catch these sort of um, production issues as early as possible in the development stage. Um, worst case in the test um, stage. Once you get into stage or production systems, the cost of fixing issues like this exponentially increases because now um, you have to go back and you have to um, have production issues, go back into development, do patches of code, um, and the cost of fixing them and the potential damage exponentially goes up. And I think that this Classic attacks like the Equifax attack where companies are directly targeted are 
are fairly straightforward to resolve, but there's a new class of attacks, and this is kind of the new age of security vulnerabilities, um, like what happens with the SolarWinds hack, <clears throat> where um, security vulnerabilities are now heading upstream into the software supply chain. So in the case of SolarWinds, um, they were actually um, hacked inside of their system. They had 4,000 lines of malicious code added after compilation. And this was compiled, um, certified by them. Their CI CD system was hacked. And then 18,000 customers received an update with the back door. Um, and all this was done by um, a Russian intelligence service, SVR and um, caused a tremendous amount of, of damage and a bunch of government mandates to fix this. So this is a, a tremendous problem. Um, now you not only have to worry about securing your software, but securing the whole pipeline of dependencies and things which you're relying upon because those are potential vulnerabilities upstream. And this really is just the, the tip of the iceberg for different vulnerability attacks which could occur. So, um, Think about all the systems which you use on a daily basis as a as a software developer. For example, um, we're all using NPM to get our JavaScript packages. We're using PyPy to get our Python um, libraries. We're using Ruby Gems. We're using Maven Central. We're using um, Docker Hub. And the question to ask yourself for all of these systems is how secure are these systems, um, and um, is, are the packages you're downloading, um, are they, are they, um, do they have any malware? Do they have any um, potential security exploits in them? And I think a great way of um, thinking about this is here's a quote from Dan Larenk, who's the creator of SigStore. Um, Every time you pip install GoGet or Maven fetch something, you're doing the equivalent of plugging a thumb drive you found on the sidewalk into your production server. So this is a, a huge potential security problem for all of us. Um, it's something which you need to pay a lot of attention to. And recently, the JFROC security team has been doing a lot of research into this um, for different target vectors, doing research into systems like um, NPM and PyPy to find um, security exploits. And um, they, they found a, um, hundreds of um, vulnerable packages in PyPy and NPM um, where they just by installing them or, or just by having a dependency on them, um, the package installation process would install malware on your computer. So um, they went through and scraped the um, PyPy, the Python package index. Um, you, you, this is what you use to install your Python packages. It downloads it, um, the package from PyPy and anyone can add a new module to PyPy. It's very, very easy to do this. Um, so the security research team at JFrog, they, they both search for all the security exploits. They find CVs, they find zero day vulnerabilities in open source, closed source systems, embedded systems, and more. Um, they're kind of the guys behind our x-ray technology as well. And, um, one of the guys in the team is, um, Sveter. So, so meet, meet Sveter, who, um, apparently likes to, likes to play to ping pong. And Sveter created a, a wonderful project, which um, is called, um, obviously the library is called Sveter, and it, it opens his website from the command line. So an amazing Python packages, um, not, not a lot of code. You can actually check this out on PyPy. It's a package that exists. So very, very convenient. If, um, if Sveter can publish a new package to PyPy, so, so can you, and so can any, any security hacker who wants to he wants to compromise your system. And this, this convenience comes at a price, which is um, when you install a package, um, who says the package doesn't contain malicious code and who says the package doesn't depend on something which contains malicious code. So um, this sort of supply chain attack is um, hitting the industry. It recently affected a whole bunch of companies like Apple, Apple Microsoft, Tesla, and others. Um, you can solve this very elegantly with um, using Artifactory and X-Ray. And um, all these large-scale security exploits, which you hear about in the news, they were discovered by um, chance, not by automated tools. So you definitely want to be on the side of using automated tools to uncover vulnerabilities like this. So if you look at some of the specific vulnerabilities, which we discovered in PyPy, 
um, we found malicious code, which is using eval statements with constant input, trying to read and write sensitive files, spawning command shells, pipes, and network sockets, and evaluating arbitrary um, network as code. And um, we did this. We ran scanners on the entire PyPy package, got 300k of 300k packages, and got 6k hits of code, um, which had potentially vulnerable things in it. Um, and we're able to find some specific examples of, of code, which was stealing credit cards. So Noblesse and Pythagora were two examples of this. Um, combined, they had 30,000 downloads. And basically what they, what they do is they take advantage of your stored credentials inside a browser autofill. So something most modern browsers support, you can, you can save addresses, you can save passwords, you can save credit card information. And these are very well protected against websites. They are not that well protected um, against automated tools. So it's um, very easy for an automated tool to now go in, um, get inside the SQLite database, which stores all these credentials. It's stored unencrypted um, or it's stored encrypted using the current user credentials. And you can obtain it transparently using crypt unprotect data. So once you're logged in, um, a malicious process can just decrypt all of this stuff using your current credentials. And here is the actual code for a credit card stealer. So um, this is this is um, code from a PyPy package. We reported it. It was taken down. Um, but this is the sort of vulnerability you're exposing to yourself just by using software dependencies um, in PyPy and other public repositories. So how, how do you go about solving this whole new class of security issues where upstream packages and open source projects are, are affecting the entire software security lifecycle? Um, so we actually launched a, a new project at JFrog designed to, to address this problem. Um, again, this is, this is as futuristic as you get. We're using all the, the latest technologies for peer-to-peer um, -peer technologies and um, blockchain to, to build a trusted binary package network that is secure by default. So you get a very high level of security. It's reliable. So you get peer-to-peer -peer downloads and it's, it's very easy for you to um, um, download from multiple trusted repositories or from just folks who are nearby you and it's open. It's open source, it's vendor neutral, so we're collaborating with other companies like, um, like Docker and Deploy Hub and bringing to life this binary distribution network which will allow you to get all of your software dependencies from a trusted, reliable, and um, fault tolerant network. Uh, so it's an entirely decentralized package registry um, based on peer-to-peer -peer technology, based on blockchain for transparency ledger, and um, also we're going to support multi-node verification of source builds where reproducible builds are possible. So you have an even higher guarantee that the binary you're getting is exactly what was built off of source code um, since it was built by multiple independent parties. So um, you can find out more at the, the URL, github.com slash Persia. And uh, we're, we're just in the stages of kicking off this project as an open SSF project, the, the new Linux Foundation open source security project, and would be excited to get, um, you know, feedback and input as we're, as we're developing it. Okay, so getting, getting kind of back to, to how things turned out. So here's, here's how we thought the machines would attack, right? Um, we expected them to come, big robots take over the world, Skynet was going to take over, but actually the way the machines are attacking is, is more like this. So um, it's going to be it's going to be a swarm. Um, it's going to be viral attacks. They're going to um, basically take advantage of security as a way of invade, invading um, um, human society. And I think that you know we we not only need to take care of the the current security exploits which which are affecting us today, but also the future security exploits by even more intelligent attackers, which are probably going to be the um, artificial intelligence of the future. Um, so in, in closing, I think that, you know, when we, when we hit the singularity, one of the most important things is that um, the next generation of developers is also set up. So one of the things which I, I love doing is um, teaching kids workshops. And um, this is a great way to introduce the next generation of um, programmers to um, um, 
to the new robot overlords, get them comfortable with um, becoming friends with robots um, and not not fighting them. And um, I think in, in doing this, we're also increasing diversity because um, I found that um, when you teach kids early, they get excited about technology and you're getting a whole new generation of folks um, and a more diverse set of folks interested in, in software technology and interested to learn more about how they can program, how they can do DevOps, and how they can start building and deploying cloud native technologies. So um, thank you all very much for, for coming to my talk. And um, again, here, if you want to participate in the raffle for the Nintendo Switch, hop by this, this URL. Um, and um, thanks everyone for coming out to the talk. And I I hope you all learned a little bit about um, you know, the coming singularity, about how to improve your DevOps pipelines and processes, how to improve software security. And of course, you know, if you're interested to find out more or to, to help out with the Persia project, you can find more information at the, um, the URL, which I, I sent out our, our GitHub site, github.com slash Persia, where we're, we're launching the project. So thanks everybody very much and um, enjoy the rest of the DevOps stars conference. Looks like, looks like Pavel is lagging as well. <laughs> looks like the singularity already took over my internet. All righty then. Can you hear me, everyone? Oh, we can hear you. Yeah. You can hear me. Uh, but if is my video is okay. Hmm. Oh, it's not okay. So I'm guessing I'm going to help you with this one. Uh, so right, we have a next speaker already here waiting to be introduced. It's Chris. Well, I don't have actually, I don't know how to read this. Uh, name properly but let's, i try as best that i can chris why terrier no i give up i give up sorry chris hello hey, i see hello. a lot back there hey hey chris so you're gonna your talk is about uh, observability and that this will not fix your broken monitoring exactly i let paul paul reboot his devices and i have i leave the stage to you okay good Right. Are we running in time? Or just to start? I yes, guess? everything is in time. OK, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So yes, um, what is it for everybody? For me, it's evening. So good evening. Um, my name is Chris Bertard. Apparently, really, really, really hard to pronounce. Um, um, I'll be talking today about how observability will not fix your broken monitoring. Um, for those who don't know me, Ages ago, when I still had hair, I used to be a developer and I used to write code. And then I eventually became an operations person. And now I'm basically helping people to deliver software, to deploy large scale infrastructures, leveraging open source software. Um, you might know me from different conferences such as DevOps Days, Conflict Management Camp, and a couple of others, um, or from the title of my blog, which is Everything is a Freaking DNS Problem, which most of you already have realized. But enough about me. Monitoring. Although not everybody does it, everybody needs monitoring. And what is monitoring? It's really the idea that we can get a high level overview of the state of our infrastructure, of a service, of a certain component. It's about answering. What is the availability? Is it still working? Is it about the performance? And it's really asking ourselves, like, what is going on in our infrastructure? How is that different from observability? Well, observability is really about understanding how our services behave. Like if we were in their place, if we were looking at our surroundings and figuring out what other incidents were happening. and what was happening around it. And this so that we could actually 
answer the question like why is this going on and that trying to do that without actually having to write incident specific code so obviously those two are really tightly connected i mean monitoring is something you really need and if you're lucky monitoring is, is enough because you know what's happening but as my colleague and good friend julia Pivoto says observability is about removing that luck from the equation. It's about understanding and realizing what is really happening with insight from the insight of your ecosystem. And if we look at what observability is in practice, it, it basically means there are three big pillars. It's about collecting metrics of every moving component in your infrastructure, in your application. It's about looking at collecting, enriching, and sharing those log files. And it's about the traces your applications can send. Metrics, typically server requests, memory, CPU, whatever, business metrics included, your default stuff. Logs is really like what has happened on my system level. And traces are a bit more deeper. Right? seeing what components have been used, how long it took from one component to talk to another, and really understand what happens when you do an HTTP call. Now, if we take a step back and we look at our traditional monitoring, the main problem we see is that typical a monitoring setup drifts from reality. Most organizations we work with as consultants we see a total lack of automation. Monitoring is something as an afterthought. And even though John Finn's uh, statement on Twitter was 2012, monitoring sucks for a lot of organization, it is still the fact. It's because they have failed to automate. It's because they are still using the wrong tools or aren't using the tools they have at hand in a really good way. So monitoring is something that for a lot of organizations that haven't seen the light is still a lot of work to maintain. And it basically ends up that a lot of IT departments have alert fatigue. Is this thing on? Is it not? We don't know. It's partially broken. It's not. And people start ignoring the alerts because they aren't really useful. They aren't really working. So a lot of people are frustrated with this approach. It's still there. And they all think, well, there's this new kid on the block. There's this new tool, there's observability. And they start looking into it. So let me take you on a journey about a couple of cases we've witnessed with actual customers over the past two to three years. The first case I want to talk about is a large government agency which had a large check in case of it. It had a lot of custom checks, but most of the checks were created manually. There was no automation. They had kind of a custom CMDB, which was really out of sync with reality. People would be decommissioning services, not updating the CMDB, or people would be provisioning new services and also not updating it. So that CMDB really could not be trusted as a single source of truth. Obviously, that meant there was a really unhappy on-call team. They were actually really happy with the tool, how it worked and how they could use it, but they were really unhappy with being left out of the information loop. Like if a service is being decommissioned, they really wanted to know about that and they weren't. So nobody updated the configuration. And the other thing they were really not happy about was for a number of the services they were being on call for, they had no clue what was really the owner of that service. So the challenge was, how do we fix this? And their management said, well, we're, we're going to fix this by introducing this new thing, which is called observability. So yeah, how do you do this? Well, we start from scratch. We take a fancy new tool, which everybody's using. So you move to Prometheus and then you start spending time learning that new stack. 
start spending time figuring out how it works, how it integrates with a new technology stack, because new technology is where it all at. And the plan then was, once we have adopted this within the new technology stack, we'll migrate the old components. As you can imagine, one year later, the old tool was still, so CheckMK was still the primary alerting tool. And rather than actually having moved forward and have improved their monitoring, they just added another tool to manage. And now they had two silos. They had one for the new technology, which was partially unmaintained. And they had one for the old technology, which was completely unmaintained. And the real goal of that effort, like really seeing how things behave from within inside the application, the real observability never really happened. The second case I want to talk to you about is an ecosystem, an organization that had really full automation. They were using Ikinga as a tool for their monitoring. They had no manual configuration. They really had a focus on keeping that dashboard green. And they started to add Prometheus as a tool for better visibility on some components. Um, they had a happy on call team. It was a good mix um, for things where they needed debugging. They were slowly adopting new technologies. And their on call team was quite happy. And then a new container stack was being built. As one does, Prometheus was chosen to actually do the monitoring and the alerting for that stack. But it was the really isolated group that started working on that new container stack. They were getting their alerts from Alert Manager via Telegram. The alerts were everything the other people were not used to. They were unclear, they were confusing, they didn't really mention the problem. Sometimes they didn't really mention what environment was running, and it was full of false positive. And while the original call team was really happy with the tools they had in place, they had an awesome automated setup, they weren't really that happy to take on the new platform because lots of false positives, lots of lack of tuning, lack of tuning on how to actually use the platform, lack of tuning on the application level and seeing how the applications were behaving. So 18 months down the road, a new effort was set to actually try and take all the best practices that were already in place on monitoring and implement those into the new monitoring platform. And after that, the framework started to become usable and they started to really look at using the tool for observability. But it took some time to get there. A third case I briefly wanted to touch on with you is what really is observability? Is observability even good for you? So we had this other customer who was running a software as a service platform. And they had set as their target for that year, we want observability. And the reasons they wanted observability was because they had a performance problem. So they thought. They also wanted alerts on cron jobs and they also wanted new dashboards. Once you start talking to them and you say, so what is your performance problem? Where do you want to have insights? What is really happening? It turned out they didn't even look at the most basic MySQL slow query logs. They were just assuming that they needed new tools to fix their existing problems while they already had all the information at hand. They also wanted to have alerts on their dashboards. But when we talked to their operations people, they were like, yes, but we have alerts on our cron jobs. They fail once in a while. And we talk to the people who are responsible for the application and they ignore us every single time. So we just acknowledge and even are about to disable those checks because they're not using them. So the real question there was like, why are you ignoring it? And it turned out that eventually we were, they were actually talking to the wrong people. And the people that were caring about it didn't know that it was already in place. It was just a matter of miscommunication. 
And then they wanted to have basic business metrics, basic business metrics that they didn't expose from the application, but they assumed that the observability tool would magically calculate those things, magically create metrics out of nowhere. Apparently, that's what some salespeople tell to their customers. You don't need to do anything. Just drop this tool in place and everything will happen magically. Basically, what we end up realizing, and I have to admit, being a consultant, you get to deal with customers who are having problems, who need your help. But what we've seen for a period is that a lot of people claim to be doing observability while they're actually not doing observability. They're doing things left and right with their monitoring, but they're not really digging into how does my application really behave. Yet they're using the tools that could help them. But this was really about observability, right? So how do you get there? Because that is really the challenge. What are really your goals to get there? Do you expect performance problems? Do you have performance problems? Or do you just have chaos and you want to have better insight in what you run? The last three reasons for people wanting to do observability is actually also where it is. People just want to use those tools because it's it, because they want to acquire new hires and they only can do so if they use those tools. They just want to play with those tools for no valid reason. And, and sadly, what we'll get is in two to three years, we'll have people who will want to have these setups because Gartner told them. But now really, how do you get there? The first part is to step back to fixing your monitoring, fixing your monitoring so that it's automated, so that you have a single source of truth on which you can really depend and that you can create clear and actionable alerts. And definitely that's important. Like your alerts need to be clear and actionable. If they're not actionable, if you send alerts to people which they really cannot do anything about, they're going to ignore them. And then you need to create a culture where you have people who really keep that dashboard green, where it's a shared responsibility between the people who own the platform, whether that be developers or operations people or whatever skills that they have, and keep it healthy. Then you start and look at fixing your metrics. Because I'm quite sure that you have regression in shipping your metrics. That's very nice MySQL performance dashboard you had. I bet it's broken. I bet you haven't looked at it for a couple of weeks and now suddenly you don't have the metrics anymore you want. Or somebody has broken your dashboard. Somebody has edited and it don't look anymore the way you want them. You want to have some kind of pipeline for your dashboards where people have a read-only production dashboard and development ecosystem, things like uh, our dashboard manager, which is an open source project we're working on, can actually help you there. And I'm also sure that your logic is going to be broken because you haven't looked at that particular instance of application yet, and they've changed something. And even worse, you've removed your log 4 j libraries and you're not shipping any logs anymore. Are you sure? So getting that back in place, then start asking the questions. Who wants observability? Why do they want it? Why do they really want it? And get them in a room and ask them what's really hurting them and where they are looking for help and what they really need. I mean, it's trivial, right? This is what we've been doing. This is what we've been talking about when we talked about DevOps adoption. This literally is exactly the same figuring out how people collaborate, figuring out how people work together to solve the problems they're facing. And then choose your open source observability stack. There's different components out there. There's different tools which you can use. But depending on your use case, you might want to look into the ones that have a sustainable future. 
you might want to exclude the ones that aren't really open source and push further and see where the future is heading. And then you want to build that automated observability infrastructure. Or you want somebody to build it for you. You want to make sure that you can spin this up, that you can reproduce it, and that you can scale it if you need it. And you want to monitor it, because who's monitoring the monitors? So some external check that checks if your monitoring platform or your observability platform is still functioning is definitely an interesting one. And then find that key project. Find that initial project where you know, this is one where we have developers that are interested in collaborating. This is one where we have product owners who are actually having time and need to invest and to see how they can learn and how to use those tools. And they can start with building dashboards based on the metrics, based on the traces you gather. And build those dashboards together with your peers. And you'll end up having the discussions between how many dashboards do you need? People will have different views on what they need from a dashboard. So you might be building different dashboards with different points of view based on the same data sets. Because somebody in a product owner role might be interested in different components than the developer who's actually writing code to do so. And once you have that, you figure out what's missing and you go over it again. And then you start adding things like tracing. But don't turn it on by default, because if you turn it on by default, you will DDoS yourself. You will do things like, for example, get all the MySQL parameters from MySQL exported. You'll kill your disks, you'll kill Cortex in the back. Or you will be constantly sending traces, effectively DDoSing yourself with a lot of storage and a lot of traces. And you won't find any of them. So another challenging question is, will this even fit my ecosystem? Lots of the vendors will come out and say, hey, this is going to work out of the box. But your developers will say, well, it might need some additional work. It might need some orchestration. When they say so, trust your developers. The framework maturity is really not there yet. Things are evolving on a daily basis. Depending on the language, depending on the frameworks you're using, you will get different results. So basic components, basic frameworks will get you some things, but you can only get so much with no instrumentation. So keep in mind that you will potentially need to modify your source code in order to really send useful traces, in order to really benefit and learn how to do observability. To wrap up and to summarize, your team might not be ready for observability. You might not even need it yet. But what you really need to do today is actually fix your monitoring. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Chris. So, uh, well, looks looks like it's it's not only the the global computers and not not only in the future we may have some challenges from our machine brothers it, it looks like my laptop already decided that <laughs> he doesn't want to behave uh, i'll try to switch off my camera maybe this will help can you still hear me i can still hear you Awesome, awesome. Yes, for some reason, when I turn on my camera, everything just um, shuts off, like X, 
very weird. Thank you, Chris, for your presentation. And uh, we will be waiting for you during our Q&A session at the end of this block. And we are actually really excited that we have more uh, topics about uh, this same issues, the, the same questions. So we have in some of our partners, our sponsors, so both JFrog and Neuroligion, they, they kind of help to handle this, this whole thing with the observability and the security and how they integrate it into their CI CD pipelines. So really cool topics, uh, very important for the um, for the whole DevOps infrastructure, I mean, not the infrastructure, but for the whole DevOps business, I would say for the for the uh, for the trade, I would say for the profession of the DevOps engineers. So, thank you very much, Chris. Very interesting, very useful, and we will uh, welcome you at the end of this blog for the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. See you later. I hope <laughs> I hope you will see me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I want to in, uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, so we have the Rajakashmi with us. Hi, how are you doing today? Please Hello. turn on your microphone. Yeah, now we can hear you. Hi, how are you? Doing great, but my laptop acts really weird for some reason. I don't know why. But yeah, and um, thank you for joining us. And thank you to Zaha for uh, joining us as sponsors, another great company who decided to to support us as a as a community, as a DevOps event. And thank you for the topic. Thank you for uh, actually sharing with us some some awesome, um, I would say, uh, approaches like the low code, no code, FAS and uh, AI ops uh, and everything. Uh, that's really um, I would say the on the very edge, very uh, innovative, very interesting, and uh, we are excited to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Good I will being... add your presentation to the to the main screen. Yes, sure. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Happy to virtually meet you all through this event. Hope you're all fine and safe wherever you are, whichever part of the world you have joined from. I've joined from India and I could see people from across the globe joining the event. And uh, I've also been listening to a few other talks since the event started. And uh, we have been hearing about uh, DevOps the, because the submit is about DevOps. Most of the DevOps are here. We have been hearing about this topic throughout the day. And mine will also be focusing on DevOps because that's the topic that we have. And to give a bit of uh, introduction about uh, myself, I'm uh, Raj Lakshmi. Just call me Raji, that should do. So I've been associated uh, with uh, Zoho uh, for the past two decades, two plus decades, 22 years at Zoho. And based on my experience of working or starting my work as a developer to where I am today, we have been handling products and uh, operations from development to operations to DevOps. And some of the pointers that I'll be sharing are based on my experience in this domain as well. So feel free to keep your questions coming. I know I've been uh, presenting from another uh, platform, but I'd be happy to take them after the event. I'll join for the Q&A as well as I'll reply to your questions in the chat after the session. I may not be able to do it lively because I'm doing the event live. All right. So the topics that we'll be discussing today are about uh, uh, how the application has transformed from where it was two, two decades ago to where it is today and how is uh, IT management itself happening from uh, the traditional IT to function as a service, the transformation as such, and about DevOps, how I see DevOps as, and what are the challenges that are faced by DevOps today, and uh, some stats to substantiate my points on whatever is important in today's world, and about uh, telemetry, open telemetry. That is the, that's a hot topic that is picking up, and how uh, um, providers or vendors are uh, uh, trying to, what they are trying to do in that space, and what you have to look for when you have to choose a tool for your monitoring needs. So 
I'll uh, I'll just spend some five minutes on each of this topic, and I must be done by in another thirty minutes. I think we are well in within time, so I will also be able to finish it in time. So the application transformation itself. What is an application? If you take developer or DevOps, whatever we talk about, anything, everything revolves around building application. An application is, to put it in simple terms, it's a client server architecture, a simple client server architecture we can call. So possibly to when I started in the early days of uh, development, it, this is how a simple client server architecture used to look. There is a server component. And it could sometimes, or most of the times, reside in your premise, physical server, and then the client that connects with the server. That's a simple client-server architecture. In fact, the client also is within the same network. This, this was how the client-server architecture was. But with Web 2.2, that is the time frame where all along that time frame, Web was only considered a medium of consuming content. And with Web 2.0, which started picking up in 2005 timeframes, 15, 16 years ago, the web was not considered a medium of consuming content, but also as a medium of contributing content. So with, when, with that picking up, there were the, the client server architecture also changed where you can have your server at any part of the world and then connect your client using your mobile or your uh, laptop through internet from anywhere in the world. So that is how the client server architecture changed. And with web picking up, public providers started picking up. So we had many public cloud providers using which the servers can be just, um, you do not own the server. You can just make use of the service and lot of providers as a service. I'll be talking about them in the future slides as well. So public cloud servers started picking up. But not everything or the, the business landscape did not move to the cloud. Cloud is picking. We, we see that that is that is where uh, the different industries are in different uh, journeys, the digital transformation. But there are still few which are on premise and the hybrid cloud is what is in existence today. We have to say so there are still some part of the business which cannot be taken to the cloud, which is still private cloud as well as public cloud. So both of them coexist. That is the typical transformation that has happened in the past two decades. And if you have to, if I have to put it in uh, another terms or a, a different terminology, what was once a monolith architecture that you have, even though you have your user interface or your business logic, your data access layer, your caching layer, all of them can be different components, but still all of them are part of one mega monolith architecture. So that is, if one component fails, the entire system goes down. It's one system. So from, from such a monolith architecture, the it is getting transformed to microservice architecture, where each of these components, each of these can be run as a separate service, where you can have your business logic as a se separate service. You can have your data accessing as a separate service. You can have your caching and queuing layers as different uh, separate services. And each of these services, since it's a microservice, it is deployed, it is returned, it is deployed, it is spawned, destroyed on its own. It looks simple, but the complexity lies in how do you take care of monitoring this infrastructure? So that is where the complexity lies. So the industry is moving from monolith to microservice architecture. And the next advancement in that is the serverless architecture where I don't even want to have a server and then I have to write an application. I write a, um, uh, what is it, backend component and a frontend component. No, you can, you just have to write some functions, make use of existing functions and you can come up, you can come up with your own application as such. I can make use of an existing provider's function for my authentication. I can make use of another provider's function for my uh, payment gateway. I can use another for my queuing and caching services. So you, I can make use of all these functions and still come up with a complete application. So that is the world where things are evolving and things are moving. That's what is the serverless architecture. That's the function as a service. But again, these three, if you take monolith to microservice to serverless, this is again a transformation. Not every application or not every business is completely transformed. Each and every business is unique and depending on their needs, people are moving towards. But this is the journey that it is that is happening in the industry. So if I have to uh, put the put it in another term as to um, how the how is your IT management itself has moved from traditional IT to function as a service, 
this is these are all the different layers in any IT infrastructure from your data center to your network storage virtualization middleware components to your data layer to application to function two decades ago the traditional on-premise IT environment all of this has to be self-managed even today there are businesses which just self-manage this but let's see how this has transformed over these years so from managing all these layers and all these components by yourself being a self-managed provider to there have been providers which are coming up as a service. Data center alone is available as a service, which is co-locations. Rest of you can just take the data center part and then apply, or, I mean, make use of it and build all these components on top of it. That is co-location. Moving on is the hosting providers. Until the server layer, there are, serv there are providers who provides this. And then you take, you do apply virtualization, middleware, and write your own application, take care of them by yourself. There are many, if we have to say some example, Linode is a hosting provider through uh, from whom you can buy servers. All your AWS, Azure, all these also are hosting providers where you can purchase servers and take care of all your virtualizations. The next transformation is IaaS, infrastructure as a service, where until the virtualization layer, it is taken care, and on top of it, the rest of it is self-managed. So from infrastructure as a service, Again, the next layer is platform as a service, your platform components of your queues, your cache, your databases, all these are available as service. You just have to focus only on your application, write your application and rest of it is left to the providers. You can just make use of the services that are available and build your entire business on top of it. So that model is also available. So the next is you don't even have to write your application make use of the existing functions that are available, write your own functions, small functions, and integrate them and still come up with your entire uh, application or entire business logic that is required. So that is the transformation, that is the function as a service. And software as a service. Everything runs or it's provided as a service and you are the end customer. Possibly people who are watching, you could be a DevOps person, you could be a developer, you could be a business owner, and you can be in various parts of these layers that we are talking about. The, um, uh, the on Site24-7 as a product itself is software as a service. Zoho has a lot of software as a service. We are now doing this live streaming to StreamYard. That's completely software as a service. We are, it's, everything is provided as service and we are just on the consuming end. If you are on the, you could be on the consuming end or you could be on the providing end. What are the things that you need to take care is what I'll be covering in the future slides. So let's keep from, keep this here and move on to how I see DevOps or how I define DevOps is DevOps. We have been hearing a lot from uh, not just in this conference. I'm sure we would have attended many other conferences and we have many definitions for it. So I, I, I visualize it in a little bit uh, different way, I should say. So there is a stream that is called developers. There, it still exists. There are developers here whose role is to write code, make sure that you can write it in any language you want. So um, uh, write your code, um, compile it, or uh, make a build, check into the repository, and make sure you correct all the code level errors, and then bundle it. That's all. With that, they think their job is done, and pass it on to the other person. Who's the other person? Operator. So the operator is the one who actually takes care of deploying the build, making sure there are no problems, keeping up with the SLAs, attending to customer compliance, and then looking at the performance analysis and making sure things are working fine to um, uh, taking care of scalability and um, availability performance. All this used to be the role of operator. But these two roles merged. And this is how DevOps is today. The person, it could um, the DevOps is a role that is played by a person. It could be a he or a she. They have to have some amount of knowledge of what is happening in development to how it, how things are being deployed. Because in this uh, digital world where we need to deploy and release builds faster, quicker releases and more releases, DevOps is crucial. So, which means you have to know what is happening. We cannot just say that, no, that is that is another person's role. They will take care of it and, and, and I, I'm dependent on them, um, the operator or the developer, vice versa. I'm dependent on the other person for inputs. So that is that uh, that line is be vanishing and these two roles are merging. And that is how I see DevOps as. 
and these all these metrics that they are doing all these roles that they are doing all the all the works that they do they have to heavily depend on tools could be anything we'll talk about it later too but tools are important for devops and now that things are in the cloud there is one more that is important for devops the devops is getting transformed to devsecops security is crucial because things are all on the cloud if you are on the producing end you are, your consumers your customers are trusting you and giving all their data and you have to make sure that you keep all of them safe it could be in the development in the way you design your database so that one user's data is not visible to another data another user or it could be in your deployment and and in the way you build your web client where you make sure that it is all safe and secure nobody can hack it because that is in the in the stack that i talked about that can be problems or that could be security leaks in any of those layers it could be in the end user layer or it could be in your application layer it could be in your network layer that can be problems anywhere it's a responsibility of the devops person to make sure that everything is safe and secure security is taken care at all the layers and that's why this role is getting transformed to devsec ops so if i merge this with the layers that we have been talking about possibly you are you are a person who uses a, a, a platform as a service or function as a service or ias as a service could be anything but it is very important for you to make sure that from your functions to applications to network all security at all layers is taken care and that is the crucial role of devops becoming devsec ops so with this introduction of the different layers and devops and uh, uh, devsecops let's move on to what are the challenges that they are facing we have been talking about uh, i'm sure all this is the challenges that we talk about are all nothing new because it's it's day in day out each one of us are facing and i've heard the same thing being discussed in other presentations too but more and more that's the reality so that uh, when we when we have to talk about challenges will um, it's it will it will look like a, a repetition but then the, those are the challenges that devops are facing there are many challenges in their day to day life of any devops but i'll be focusing on only the primary three challenge because otherwise that itself will run each of these sections can be discussed separately as the 30 minute long session so what are the, what is the crucial challenge you you as a devop Uh, devops person you are uh, you are you are deploying or you are having your entire system running in the cloud environment so the primary challenge is availability making sure all uptime making sure all the components all the layers whatever you have are up and running be it your application or your database layer or it could be a that could be a small problem in one of the port in in the switch in your network your entire system will not work that could be an isp problem in a, in a part for a particular user you are, you are, you have to you have to take care of that so the problem could be in any layer availability across all these layers it's not sufficient i have taken care that my application is up and running your server has to be up and running your network layer has to be functioning properly your database has to be up and running uptime across all the layers is important that and that's a primary challenge and industry standards are expecting 99.999% availability five nines is three nines to five nines is how the industry has transformed that's the first challenge and the second challenge is of course performance there is no point in having all your resources all your components up and running if they are going to be performing very very slow none of us in this fast moving world has the time or patience to sit and watch pages that are going to take forever to load we'll just skip on move on to the next page that is that is the that's the industry we are in today and that is the that's a competitive world too whatever whoever is your competition you take performance plays a crucial role industry standards expect 2 seconds for any web page to be loaded how do you make sure your page comes up in any search engine optimized search engine all these are dependent on performance and that is something that has to be monitored so availability uptime is important performance is equally important in across all these layers and the third challenge is security being in the cloud we cannot ignore security because that is to that is to play with the trust that the customer has on the organization there are many other challenges like uh, de dealing with the capacity planning and scalability and uh, looking at the cost all those will come in place but i would want to 
focus on these three important ones and or i would classify these three as the primary important challenge for any devops person when they take care of their infrastructure so availability performance and security so i did uh, look at to when i was preparing for this talk i was uh, looking at or re referring various articles and and this uh, as i i i'm presenting certain survey stats which i think is uh, relevant or which substantiates the points that i have been talking about i have taken two uh, sources one is our own survey which we have done with the uh, i with the um, it it management survey that we did with the customers but to be neutral i have also taken another where i i was able to compare and see that it is almost the same so which means the industry standards or industry expectation from people are similar all in the similar lines so the um, i've given the sources here the atlassian um, uh, report or the survey that uh, that talks about the devops survey and our own and it was done with 500 different people of different uh, um, region different uh, roles that they played and we did our own survey and we have responses from 600 different people from different across the globe as well as they they were they they belong to different industry education it medic healthcare uh, finance banking the industry varied, industries varied and the roles they played be it it admins devops or the director of uh, technology so the roles also varied we have all those insights and there are 50 different uh, uh, questions and answers that have been collated i've just taken five important things that are relevant to this talk so if I, if you have to see there are certain, still there is a dilemma of do i have to do uh, devops in any organization and the survey results from the atlassian one says that high quality deliverables and faster time to market by the top ones based on the impact of devops in an organization so if you have implemented devops and you are you will be able to do quicker uh, um, releases which will which will uh, help you in taking the product quickly to the market and uh, the some of the important traits if you are thinking of implementing devops in your organization is the right set of people with the current with the correct company culture and the right set of tools these plays the crucial role if you uh, and these are the some of the important traits if you are looking for implementing devops and uh, this is an interesting question number of tools that any project that you use to understand any product or any project this actually varies if you pay take an average there are some people who use one to two in uh, um, in 2018 to three to four so average is around three to four or four to five different tools that people are using i'll talk about why i'm insisting on this number of different tools that people are using so this this these were some of the facts now when we did our own survey with respect to what is the issue that is being faced when you are having a website hosting so the top issue that was discussed was performance issues due to slowness and uh, uptime issues because of the hosting uh, hosting provider and managing renewals of ssl certificate if you see availability uptime performance security those were the top challenges or top issues faced in a website hosting and uh, data center outage what are some of the reasons for data center outage it could be server crash or database cr issue or code issue all these were different issues that were that topped the result in in our survey so data center challenges are there any data center challenges what are the challenges cost is an important challenge you have to take about take care of capacity planning is another challenge real time monitoring of your entire system is a challenge so these are some of the challenges that are being faced and if you have to talk about production app issues is that i'm i have just taken few bits from your end uh, website layer application layer and and your network layer too so what is a production app issue the performance bottleneck in your application functionality breakages so these are some of the issues and if you have to tackle all these issues or to identify where the issue and to uh, identify and fix identifying is half the way done with solving the problem so identifying the problem is crucial and that is possible with the help of tools and we also had this question of number of monitoring tools that have been used and i run this or, or uh, when we have a open uh, uh, meeting physical meetup or where we, that where i can make it interactive i often have this as a questionnaire with with the team itself or with the audience to find out what the number of tools that people are using and what are their pain points to so here again typically it ranged from 3 to 4 uh, different uh, tools that people have been using in their day to day life 
So some, what is what is that I'm trying to conclude from these surveys? What are the inferences from these surveys? Of course, yes, DevOps is important. We cannot ignore the DevOps is crucial for so that when you have DevOps in your uh, team, you will be able to do quicker releases and they depend on tools. When we talk about tools, we have seen that people have been using different tools. It, it varies from three to four or four to five, it could be anything. But when you have different tools for monitoring different layers of your of your entire infrastructure, possibly you are using one tool for your website, another tool for your application, another tool for your server, another tool for your network. How do you know when a problem occurs, which tool to look into and where the problem is? You will end up building a tool on top of it or building something on top of it to make sure that you look at uh, the, all these data in one place. And this has also led to people wanting to do or wanting to go. Uh, and the other problem that is uh, that that happens when you are using two multiple tools is you are more more likely to be tied up with the vendor. So that is when industry or people or experts have been uh, working, and people want to make it vendor agnostic, vendor neutral. I don't want to tie my monitoring system with any particular vendor. And uh, we have heard from our previous speakers talk about uh, um, where you have to, if you need instrumentation, you need to have uh, um, clearly, you need to have an agent that is being installed in your application. We, we heard about that in the observability talk as well. So in those cases, it is if you are if you are implementing one particular vendor's agent, you become tied up with that agent. If, even if you want to change, it's going to be difficult. So that is when there are uh, uh, like-minded people have come up with open sources, and that is the birth of this open telemetry itself. Open telemetry is more like I mean I'm, I'm sure um, the industry has not completely moved towards it, but this is this is where many providers, many many people, many customers, our own customers have uh, started asking, "Do you have support for open telemetry?" And we are coming up with the support for that too. So this is where you just you don't you're not vendor tied. Open telemetry, open source gives you the agent which you install, and there are exporters. You can have multiple. Uh, you can have your data ported to multiple places as well. So that becomes, and you can also contribute to um, the formats that are required. And this is more like on top of observability. So observability is to talk about the three important things: your metrics, your logs, and your traces. So that is those three are the important metrics that are collected. Those three are the important components that are part of open telemetry as well. But vendor agnostic, you are not dependent on any particular vendor. Even if you have to have multiple tools, you are not tied with any particular vendor. And industry is moving towards this as well. So the three major components in an open telemetry environment is you have to collect metrics. You have to collect all the relevant metrics. You have to collect traces. Traces are important. Logs are also important. I'll just briefly just take one minute for each of this to say what each of this means. So metrics is to deal with collecting relevant metrics. The metrics will vary from um, each of the segment you are monitoring. If you are if you are monitoring your um, website, the metric will be what is your response time. If even if it is application, so what is your response time? How many? Uh, how what's the throughput? How many times your website is being accessed? If you are monitoring your server layer, the metrics will be what is your CPU time, what is your memory utilization, what is your disk utilization, those will be the metrics. If you are monitoring your network, it will be the bytes in, bytes out, data transfer in, data transfer out. So the metrics will vary, but you need to collect metrics. So that is important. Whatever you want to monitor, whichever layer you want to monitor, metrics are important. The relevant, relevant metrics have to be collected. Trace. As, as we know, each of the, up, the applications can be written in any language. It could be Java, .NET, Ruby, PHP, Python, Go, or even um, serverless functions. I don't even depend on any of these languages. I just write functions. So it can be anything. But tracing is important. Trace is crucial for you to find out, identify the exact line of code that is having issue. Because once you know that your web, web page or your application is taking some 10 seconds to load, the next step is you need to know where the 10 seconds is being spent. Is it on a database query, it is taking more time, or is it happening in a, in a loop in a function, or is it the time that is taken to render it in the web client? Can be anywhere. So you need to know exactly where the time is being spent for which trace will be important. And when we talk about trace, 
we are talking about moving from monolith to microservice architecture which means the each of the application can be each of the container can be can have an application or can have a function in a different language so tracing across multiple different containers and multiple different languages is the distributed tracing which is important if you have to know where the problem is because a problem in one container can have a cascading effect and affect the entire application if you don't have the proper tools in place to get to know where the problem is it's going to be challenging because we are talking about cloud environments where you cannot bring down the system it has to be up and running all the time and you have to debug with the with the systems up and running so distributed tracing is also important and logs if uh, logs is another important criteria when we talk about uh, uh, cloud infrastructure because the the your entire infrastructure is distributed across the globe any problem occurs immediately what we want to do is we want to go take remote control of the system and look at the access log or application log or event log or could be any log but it is very tedious for the devops person to take remote control of each of these machines to see what is happening in them instead collect all those logs do some real time processing and store it in such a way you can easily query and see it in one console that's what is log management to put it in simple terms converting your unstructured data into structured data is log management and that is also part of your um, open telemetry so the, these three things metrics traces logs if your monitoring system has you will be able to see or find out where where the problem is and find you in your system and make sure that you will be able to fix them properly so that is about and to add on to it ai ops ai on top of all the other things that you do can help with i am i'm just touching the basics of ai because that is again another uh, full 30 minute session it can go on so ai ops is to ai will help you with accurate anomalies without you doing any configuration the tools will be able to help you with uh, anomalies reduce noise in alerts and alert segregations helps with forecasting and hence capacity planning it can help with a lot of automation so that you can be proactive and make sure that this the uh, downtime doesn't happen where after after something is some problem has happened you have to go and fix or go and find out what has been happening is what is re being reactive instead you can make sure that you don't even get that problem in the first place so that is being proactive rather than being reactive is one of the main criteria of ai look for that as well so having said all this what are the criteria you have to look for when you choose your monitoring tools i am almost in the last section 5 minutes i'll be done so what are the criteria you have to look for in your uh, monitoring tool of course the tool that takes care of or that covers all your uh, uh, metrics traces and logs on top of it i would say look for eyes what is eyes i stands for integrable integrable c for customizable e for extensible so your tool that you are using it has to work with any in house uh, um, it must have all the import export function integration should be possible and people we are uh, we are in a age where uh, i may want to do some small tweaks and small customizations i don't want to take whatever you give as such i want to change the color or the text could be anything or i may want to completely white label so give customization options see if the tool has customization options and extensible we are living in this era of citizen coders where we don't want to just take what you are giving give apis instead give apis i will take and put it in another tool i will want to build on top of it but still it should work workable model extensible is providing uh, functions where it is workable model see if the tools can give all these three and being transparent i want um, being transparent meaning when you look at the dashboard all that you see is green be like a, when you choose a tool see if the tool is behaving like a kiwi and not like a watermelon what i mean by this is it is both green in outside as well as inside there could be some tools where which which shows green outside but if you drill down and go and see it's all red it's not working fine inside that's not what we want the tool has to be working like a kiwi where it is both outside and inside green being transparent automation so we know that there are some problems you may want to make make some uh, do some action on top of it if you are having a cpu utilization is going high you may want to restart your system if you are having a, a logs are growing up you may want to clean your logs so you may have to have some scripts and make sure that 
you are you are able to do such automations and ai capabilities look at cost as well so these are some of the things which you may have to look cost why i'm bringing cost factor here is possibly you may not even have to move to the cloud you depending on what your business is see what is best for you and then go along that direction so these are some of the things which you have to look for when you are choosing a tool there are many tools in the market site 24/7 is one such tool which is there in the market it's an all in one ai powered monitoring tool that can help you monitor take care of all your monitoring needs end to end in one single console on top of this we do have alerting reporting and ai and uh, ai capabilities too site 24/7 is a mature product we have been in the industry for 15 years i didn't go into details of each of this you can contact us any one of us i'll give details so that we can arrange de any demo if at all required and we are hosted on zoho's data center we have 10 different data centers across uh, five different regions in the globe one in us one in europe one in china one in india one in australia we are coming up with few more where you can be sure that your data resides within the geographical boundary of that particular region and being a cloud provider we do take privacy security and compliance seriously and get all the required certifications that are required to be a cloud provider so the key takeaways from this session for the last 30 minutes that i have been discussing we have seen the application architecture evolution from what it was to um, from a traditional it environment to a function as a service challenges how what is devops and what are the challenges they face and some uh, survey results to substantiate that which also helps or which also proves the rise in open telemetry what is open telemetry what are the components in it and what are some of the things which you have to look when you have to choose the right tool site 24/7 is one such tool available in the market as a token of giving back to the community if you sign up using this url you get a uh, 6 months free subscription we'll be posting this url in the chat as well so feel free to try the product yourself and uh, give your comments or we can help with any demonstration that is required so i just want to close with this quote we shape our tools and the intern shapers is a uh, one of my favorite quote from marshall mcluhan what this means is the tools that you have in your hand has a great impact on your day to day activities if you have a hammer in your hand everything will look like a nail that is screw over there but you only have a hammer in your hand and you will end up only hitting it so choose the right set of tools depending on what your business condition is and who your customers are so that you are able to make best use of it and take your business to the next level thank you so much for your time you can reach to me at uh, through email or any of my social media platform and for product demonstration please feel free to write to us at uh, support@site247.com and we'll be able to arrange any demo required thank you thank you very much thank you for the presentation and thank you for the uh for the generous offer of the uh of the 6 month uh, subscription uh we we are sure that uh this will be super useful for the community and uh there will be absolutely uh we we are absolutely delighted to have you as sponsors and as partners and thank you once again for uh sharing with us this this opportunity and yeah, uh looks like um my camera <laughs> my camera it, it left the Frozen. chat yeah. as, as they said the camera left the chat for some reason i don't know why uh so yeah and um talk to you uh in a while uh during our q a session so i'll just uh switch myself off as i did before and i'll just uh continue as a narrator as a voice uh on the background and thank you once again and i'll invite our uh next speaker i'll invite larissa hello larissa how are you doing today hello i'm fine and you doing great yeah doing great but um my camera acts like uh <laughs> <laughs> like i don't know uh maybe that's another step uh, to uh eliminating my uh, they say digital imprint so my digital <laughs> digital uh, imprint in the internet so uh thank you for uh joining us thank you for uh your presentation thank you for joining us for another event we uh we hold dear uh, our memories about 
your presentation during the QA. It was a success. Thank you once again for joining us. And I guess without any further ado, I'll just um, I'll just pull up your presentation and uh, we will continue. And um, yeah, thanks uh, for um, here it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is, I, I believe, is something that we have been uh, talking, uh, hearing uh, very much about it, but I'm going to explain a little bit uh, why it's important and actually, why is it? So what's engineering culture all about anyway? So this is what I'm going to talk a little bit. It's explain why, what it's engineering culture and why it's important and why it's so important for us to cultivate this kind of culture inside our company. So first of all, a little bit about myself. So I'm a senior manager at CINT. I have uh, more than 20 years of experience in IT. Uh, prior to that, I used to lead the test services at IBM. And also I was the head of intelligent automation at Avanade Intelligent Automation in terms of RPA and cognitive. I have uh, adorable uh, cup, couple of kids. Isadora and Arthur, and my husband works with IT as well. Actually, he works with QA and DevOps, and he'll be speaking here tomorrow, I believe, or Thursday, I'm not sure. And actually, this presentation is kind of outdated because last week I got three more dogs. So instead of 12, I have 15 dogs. I have 14 chihuahuas. So I have three puppies, and probably in about two weeks I have I'll have four more because I have a pregnant uh, chihuahua. So I have a little bit more chihuahuas. We live in a ranch, so we have plenty space for those. And uh, so I have a, I am a strategist, and I love to think about new ways of doing things. So I. I love designing thinking, and this this was one way that uh, put me into the track of agile and took me off a waterfall because since I was since the beginning with testing and now and since the early days of testing in 2004, I was really strict into waterfall and silos, etc. And when I got into designing thinking, this shook me up. And then I start to consider all things different. So I start to think about how we could really innovate. And that broadened my life. And I start to thinking really about how we could uh, do the agile engineering, how we could innovate with the software quality, and how we could really bring value and uh, start to take the repetitive tasks and really bring the lean. And then I start to work with digital transformation and more and more to share the knowledge and to speak into conferences and to see how uh, we can share everything that uh, we have been learning. And we, I mean, me and my husband, and, uh, and I try to also to promote this and bring everyone that I know that has something to talk about to speak as well, because I think it's so important for us to be able to share our knowledge with everyone else. This is for me, it's the most important thing ever. And I just love coffee so much. So here is just how much I love coffee. As a Brazilian, I'm from Brazil, so. Uh, so, first of all, we're going to pass some definitions that I believe is really important for us to understand how the term engineering culture was coined. So, what is culture? Culture is, and this is a Merriam-Webster definition, okay? So, culture is the customary beliefs, the social forms, and the material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. So, let us keep with the social group. So, it's the characteristics, features of everyday existence. So, our way of life, shared by people in a place or time. So let us consider a company, okay? So continuing. 
what is engineering? Engineering is the application of science and mathematics by which the properties of matter and the sources of energy in nature are made useful to people. The design and manufacture of complex products. What we do on a daily basis, what we all here do. Okay, great. So what is an engineering culture? So this is the shared assumptions and values and beliefs that will determine how people behave. Meaning, how we develop the software, how we solve the problems, how we deal with customers, how we work in a team. And what do I mean with values? Values, they have a strong influence on how people in the company act and how they perform their functions. So this is why an engineering culture is so important. This is why we have been listening so much about engineering culture. This is why we have Gego talking about engineering culture, we have Netflix, we have Spotify, we have everyone talking about engineering culture. Because without an engineering culture, we cannot have all our developers to have the same mindset to as in developing software, solving problems, dealing with customers and working in a team with those kind of values. Does that make sense? And how can we go like this? So why is, it, why is this important? So culture is naturally empirical. So this is practiced naturally and effortlessly. So we do it without thinking, we just do it. So this is transmitted, this is observed by osmosis. And it's almost in a cellular, this is like a, a philosophical way I'm talking, okay? But bear with me, go with me, okay? So uh, we, this is disseminated, this is dissolved in the groups of people. So when we start to work in a company and we get to talk to people and we get to see how they do their work and we start to doing their work along with them, we start to observe the culture. We start to collaborating with them and we start to observe this culture and we start to work in and as they work. So, uh, after some time that we have been working, and one thing that we notice a lot is that there are some types of cultures that fit more with us, and there are some types of company cultures that fit less with us. So this is something that we need to check every time we go to do some interview, right? So we need to check if the culture fit is really good or not. So, and the engineering culture is embedded into this. So, for example, when you go to a company that has this engineering culture, you start to absorb this. You start to have a better software delivery. You start to get things done. You start to deliver the right things. You start to have a happy team and a happy customer without realizing it. And this is why it's so important to have the engineering culture, because this becomes extremely important in solving problems, in getting the, imp the impediments collaboratively and systemically resolved. So it's not with great effort. You don't have to suffer 
to have this solved. You work in a team, you work together because you have the engineering culture, you work as a team and you work forward that team. And this is why we need to work for this. So now you come to me and say, that sounds great. How do I get there? And how do I get there? We need to get to this virtual circle. So it's not, uh, I don't j just get and say, okay, I want to get this engineering culture, make it happen. We don't get to that point. We need to have several things in place to get there. We need to have a collaborative knowledge. We need to, we need to have a collabora collaboration sharing. We need to have a recognition. We need to have a community. We need to have DevOps values. We need to have several things in order to have the engineering culture. I will explain all of those things uh, in place and what that means in terms of actions for each one of those. But this is really important that this is all a virtual circle that we need to have in place. We need to start to plan to have all of those. So first of all, we need to have skilled engineers. What I mean by those, we need to have a formal training track for the roles. We need to treat our analysts as engineers. We need to have a market benchmark to ensure that our analysts are treated as engineers, their roles are correctly according to the market, and they are paid accordingly. We need to have a known process. We need to have a structure onboarding process. They need to know what is the process. They need to know, uh, they need to understand what is the development process, the release process. They need to understand how to start into the company, what they need to do, where they need the, where they find the documentation, where they'll have access, when they will have access to the tools, where and who they can ask for this. Where is the self-service place for them to ask requests to, et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. And every time the process stands, they need to have timely refresh for this. They structure, they need to have a well and a very structured place. So with low turnaround and technical key positions. We need to have key positions in place and they need to be referenced. So we need to have people to be inspired by. I need to have role models, technical role models, and I need to be inspired by those. The collaboration sharing. So we need to have, to have knowledge pills shared. We need to have best practices. We need to have chapters. We need to have guilds. We need to have the Joes in order to have this sharing, to have this knowledge throughout the whole company. Recognition. We need to have people understand that knowledge is good and knowledge may be awarded, may be recognized with things, with anything possible. Technical eminence, DevSecOps maturity. So for the teams that have the better DevSecOps maturity, they will have more autonomy or anything like this. We need to award the people with better with better technical eminence. We need to build community, how with record, with hackathons, with technical events, etc., and etc. All of this needs to be based on DevOps values with cross collaboration. We need to measure our organization and always with short feedback cycles. 
So when I talk about the collaborative learning, we need to define all the knowledge tracks by domain. So we need to have a track for QA, a track for architecture, a track for UX, et cetera, and et cetera. We need also to have a structured self-service onboarding process. So whenever someone is onboarding, we need to, I don't know, to have a week page that the person goes there and he knows uh, correctly what he needs to learn, where and how to access that learning and to do a self-service learning and to understand what he needs to, to know and to go through all the learning and to all the things that he needs to get and also to organize a structure of decentralized meetups and chapters make the community make the company has the community has those meetups those chapters and make the community feed those make them inspired by those encourage excellence encourage the technical reference in teams Encourage your teams to talk into conferences. Encourage your teams to submit papers, to publish articles, even inside your company. Make this a weekly meetup, so get people to, to share best practices they have been doing inside their projects. So that open source, that automation, the best practices, what he has been doing. So let's share best practices among the teams, among the projects. Communicate the process clearly and frequently. So share, always share, share and share and share some more. Ensure the access to information is easy and less bureaucratic. Don't make the access that only someone can give the access. Everyone can give access. Everyone can invite someone. So let us get grant access to everyone and everyone can invite everyone this is a community for everyone and everyone can share this is really important collaborative recognition recognize the deliverables of each team so make it count celebrate always celebrate and celebrate everything Recognize the individual effort of each individual for the good of the group. So always, always recognize, recognize the individual, recognize the group, recognize everything that is going on always. And do not forget to recognize eminence and technical reference. This is really important. We want to create we want to grow the technical eminence we want to have our teams to have more and more technical reference so we need to recognize those we need to have a board with technical references we need to publish the articles that our people has been writing we need to uh, put this front forward we need to have a hackathons and this is really important and make recognition a habit we don't need always to have money to do this we can have this with pins with vouchers with anything recognition can be done without money if you don't have money but recognition needs to be done and needs to be become a habit this is really important and have several recognition mechanisms pins vouchers money money is always important but it's not the most important promotion etc uh, so money is important and it's important to have but after some time two or three months is money you lose the importance of money because the if the other things are don't go okay, the money lose the importance. This is the Mas the Maslow pyramid altogether, okay? And turn the recognition process organic. Everyone recogn recognizes everyone. Don't wait only for the leader to do the recognition. Your 
your your peer recognize your peers everyone recognizes everyone recognition is key and recognition is really really important everyone needs to recognize everyone collaborative community so connect your teams with community and purpose so this is really really important you cannot only build the community because it's fun because oh i just want to have a community no you need to connect your team with the community and with the purpose what is the purpose of the community and you need to have this strong purpose and connect this team to the purpose and create the internal hackathons as a way to collaboratively solve real challenge so have a real challenge that your customer is having for example and create the internal hackathon with this internal hackathon solve this real challenge the team will be so so happy that he was able to do it it will be awesome and do it frequently it's really really nice great technical events where everyone has room to share knowledge these technical events are really worthwhile and they are really interesting to share the knowledge so our people sharing the knowledge to the other people do a call for papers an internal call for papers where our people will share the knowledge to to their peers it will be really nice it's really nice to see there's they're sharing their knowledge create mentoring groups where the more experience help the less experience this is really nice and we learn a lot when we mentor people so they will grow they will learn more and everyone will grow in hand this is really good and share the results with the community be more open source and then pay forward so you share the results with the community and then the community that received the results will help others and then will help others and then will help others this is a complete virtual circle it's beautiful to see and this is how you start you begin to do the engineering culture you need it's it's not simple it's a lot and lot of actions that we start to build and last it's devops values so culture first not tools and not process we start with the culture culture is more important than tools and process and allow always time for teams to automate the low value added tasks no how to identify the bottlenecks and failure points and ensure this is a habit. Generate indicators and metrics that help you see and measure the impact of your actions. So always, always generate the indicators and metrics that will help you see and measure the impact of your actions. And always make feedback natural and always focus on continuous improv improvement so create your feedback cycles and after your cycle we do our pdca and we do our feedback we do our retrospective and we'll focus on what to get back or what to get better and continuous improvement always and the feedback please always give feedback feedback is always a good thing always a good thing and always stimulate the feedback make feedback natural this is also a really important thing so this is something really important so get let's get back a, a little bit after i say everything this is a really uh virtual circle virtual sorry, cycle we start with collaborative learning then you progress to collaborative recognition we go to collaborative community and we we end up with devops values 
we create all of those actions and we start this virtual circle and then before you realize you are you will start to see that people are starting to feel as if they were into an engineering culture culture not as if they were they are into an engineering culture and this is what i have to say so far so thank you very much guys and i hope you have enjoyed it and i will stay for questions and answers thank you very much all right larissa thank you very much for this uh, presentation and uh we will pause for a quick um announcement from uh from our um from our sponsor so we're going to have a short video from uh from jfrog and um and also after we will have the joint q a session and we are planning to have a great discussion because we're going to have like five or six of amazing speakers so waiting for uh this and i'll ask uh nick to to start the um you can write the best code in the world you can run the most complex systems but things get really complicated when you have dozens of different technologies and hundreds of processes fortunately it's jfrog to the rescue firstly you need universal tools that can integrate seamlessly with all the build technologies in your ci cd stack and all major cloud platforms so you can start speeding up software releases without delay Second, you need to automate every part of your DevOps pipeline, end-to-end. -end. This will eliminate repetitive, manual steps while letting you enjoy much faster feedback loops so you can get higher quality releases to customers faster. Next, you need a proven way of catching potential vulnerabilities and license compliance issues wherever they may be hiding in the DevOps cycle so you can stay out of the latest security disaster headlines. And of course, you need the flexibility of a cloud on-prem hybrid solution that offers high availability, disaster recovery, and is easily scalable and enterprise grade from code right through to production. The good news is that you don't have to look very far to find this. JFrog offers you an end-to-end -end DevOps platform for creating, managing, and distributing trusted software releases fast to anywhere in the world. It's why 5 million developers already count on our universal DevOps tools to do their job better, faster, and more securely. So wherever you are in your DevOps journey, let JFrog smooth the ride, automating your software delivery process. Learn more or get started right away by visiting us at jfrog.com. Awesome. Thank you once again, JFrog. And also we have uh, we have a survey. So basically this survey would help you to uh, to check how actually mature is your DevOps process, uh, how well established it is. And if you have any specific questions regarding the uh, the topic that Steven just presented um, a couple hours ago, we will have him in uh this q a panel just in a second so we have chris with us we have larissa we have steven with us hey steven we have amber with us hi amber and also we have and we have the rajalashmi with us hi everyone and thank you for Thank you for joining us for this event and for this q a session and i hope we're going to have an exciting uh discussion and looks like <laughs> my camera has not miraculously healed itself for some reason i don't know it was lagging on me like the whole day but i i believe um uh this hmm so this will do Steven, I, I owe you a logo on the background. So here is a logo on the background. <laughs> so, uh, there is there, like, there you go. Two J frogs. So we both, in, we both in, have in, logo, J frog logos in our background. 
Awesome, awesome. So uh, thank you once again for uh, allocating another 30 minutes for this Q&A session. And uh, thank you once again for uh, for your presentations. And I will start with uh, some questions from, uh, from our chat. And uh, who, what should we start with? Okay. Uh, so I guess this one will be um, very interesting to... Um, to actually speculate around this question. And I believe everyone would have um, something to say about it and from different perspectives, some from the perspective of uh, ops, some from the perspective of dev. So please, uh, I, would, um, I would ask Amber to start and then we'll just take turns answering this, this question. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, so first off, so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Um, let's see here. I mean, as far as the best practices to adapting DOPS, uh, DevOps, I think that your first starting point should first off be uh, to decide why you're wanting to do DevOps and really have that conversation. Uh, if you are um, really forcing that uh, without any buy-in, uh, without other people in your team that are um, willing to adopt DevOps, then you're going to have a lot of pushback and it's going to be an uphill climb. So uh, I think that your first your first action should be to identify why you want to uh, adopt DevOps uh, and then also have an open conversation with the other people, the other stakeholders that are going to be involved in this adoption and uh, really hear their perspective and increase that buy-in as you are going through that process. Yeah, that's awesome. a really and simple answer, but it's it really is your good starting point. <laughs> awesome, Amber, and 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 please pardon. Uh, I don't know what I was actually thinking about when I started started actually nominating people who should answer. I don't know why it was like it was a glitch that I took from the camera. So, <laughs> and and if anyone wants to be the next person to answer, please raise your hand and 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 you you can uh, continue. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Chris. I'll go. I, I got a couple of uh, things to say. I mean, I've been helping organizations for the past ah, decade and a half to do these kind of things. And the, the, the anti-patterns I've seen so many times is people go into a DevOps transition and 18 months down the road, they realize they didn't include the ops people. And you think like, really? But no, really. Uh, the number of time the ops people have not been involved at all, it's flabbergasting. So step one. It is about collaboration across all your skill set. Get everybody in the room. Get your ops people in the room. Um, the, the second thing um, is don't start this without having senior management buy-in. Uh, they need to push this. If they don't push it, forget about it. If this is if you try to do it grounds up and if you just try to do it grassroots, it's going to fail because you're not going to get the support you need and you really, really need that top-down support to get people aligned and get people to do what they need to do. And actually the, the, the third one I like to uh, give organizations a lot when I do coaching with them, it's, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, but it's don't call it a DevOps transition. Because the first thing you get is you get people who start discussing about what they consider DevOps and what they think this is all about. And they found all the wrong definitions and they found all the wrong ideas. And what you really want to do is get a discussion like, um, Amber just said, and get a discussion and see what you want to do, define those goals, set those goals, and then call it something completely different. Call it engineering 2.0, call it whatever you like it, and have that as a common set of goals uh, for your organization. And it removes the friction about, we're doing this DevOps thing. You're doing the new way of working within your organization, and everybody knows what we're talking about. And those are actually the three things that I definitely would advise when you start doing a DevOps journey. Awesome. And, uh, if, uh, yeah, um, sure. Thank you. Uh, Rajagashmi, thank you. Yeah. I would just add on to what uh, uh, Chris and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get uh, the first person's name correctly. <laughs> Amber, sorry, uh, what they have been uh, saying. 
So possibly from my perspective of what we have been doing with uh, in our organization too. So as Chris said, it's definitely the buy-in from the um, higher management, which is to do with the culture is important to set in. And uh, other crucial thing to um, adopt DevOps. DevOps is important. That's no, there's no doubt about it. Everybody is uh, moving towards that culture. It, we have been doing it in some form or the other, just that uh, we are redefining the names and giving it the proper uh, name as to whatever role people are playing, merging these two roles. And um, it is important to um, make sure that things are working fine in production. That's, that's the main thing that we have to focus on, for which tools are important. That's another, that's one of the things which we have seen. It could be, I mean, tools doesn't need to be a third party tool that you have been doing. It could be some small script that you have as part of your build process itself, where you keep monitoring your system as to what is happening in it. If there is a failure, you must be able to quickly identify what the failure is, where the problem is. So for which, and most of the times we, what we have seen in our own case too, is people uh, we, we tend to first ad hoc do something to get systems working. That's the first thing you have to do. Perfectly fine. I often say, don't go and stand behind that person and keep disturbing them. Leave them free. They will figure out what has to be done. And then make sure that you include those as part of your automation or day-to-day -day process so that if those thing, things are not missed out when you do further build developments. So some form of scripting is what is tools could be, to call it in simple terms, to have it in production setup definitely helps adopt DevOps easier and faster. Awesome. Um, okay, if nobody minds, so, yeah. Um, yeah, sure, let your set. Yeah, Excuse and me. I'm sorry. And also I think the, the word journey is of most importance here because this is a journey and we cannot set the wrong expectation. You cannot uh, consider, okay, I'm going to DevOps and tomorrow everything is going DevOps. So now I have DevOps. It's not going to happen. This is a journey. This is a long and painful journey. So we need to set the expectation correctly. We need to have this active buy-in and we need also to be really, uh, really straightforward that this is a journey. This is a long journey. And also we need to set correctly what is the business objectives that I want to achieve with this. And, uh, and adjust correctly my DevOps journey to this. Because not all the DevOps journey we go exactly the same. We need to correct our journey according to the business outcomes we want. A banking will have the different business outcomes that an e-commerce. All right, and uh, Stephen is the uh, the closing uh, the closing person for this question. And please save us from the from the overlords. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I think everybody had awesome um, advice and for folks starting their DevOps journey. And um, one thing which I'd, I'd like to add and reinforce, and um, this is <clears throat> so, probably sounds odd coming from the person who works for a, for a DevOps tooling company, but um, I, I think your, your journey should focus on the, the culture and the people. Because really, um, to be successful in DevOps, you need a collaboration between um, the folks who are building the code, the folks who are deploying the code, the observing of the code, and you need that continuous um, feedback loop where you're where you're improving the process, you're automating everything you can do, but not starting with. It's not about implementing a new tool. It's not about like putting a new CI/CD system or a new package manager in place. It's it's about the people, the processes, the continuous improvements, and like like getting folks involved in the company along for the for the journey, which will hopefully lead to a successful um, DevOps um, transition, transformation. Okay, thank you. And um, I believe we have um, sort of a similar question. And uh, if you don't mind, Stephen, I'll just um, uh, start from you again, like in the reverse um, order. Uh, so what would you advise uh, in 
in this case, how to automate the self-healing using the observability, what you can do with um, with this issue if someone needs to tackle the, uh, the task of observability. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> increasingly, like like if you if you look at the end to end flow of DevOps in a in a large production environment, um, it, having a good observability system where you're you're getting feedback from production and um, shifting shifting that information left towards um, folks who are doing development, folks who are building the code and giving them the feedback and the input on what's happening in production helps you to more quickly address and solve the the um, issues which you're seeing in production. And this also, um, like we were talking about a continuous feedback loop, this helps you to introduce the right sort of um, logging metrics uh, monitoring in place <clears throat> so that you can quickly um, address issues which come in. And this is this is something which, um, you know, given the increasing rate of um, security attacks and um, new exploits coming out, um, even things like the like the um, <clears throat> the log4j issue, which um, affected uh, systems across the world, um, where we all had to now kind of um, figure out wh what version am I using in production, um, how can I monitor my production instances to know if I'm vulnerable, and how can I quickly um, deploy and um, update my systems to to effectively resolve this. So I think that it's. Again, it's part of the overall DevOps feedback loop that you, you're you taking information from production and you're pushing it and shifting it back left into your development process. Awesome. Thank you. OK. Um, anyone else? Something to add? OK. There's Alchemy. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, perfectly covered on the security aspect of the of self healing and automatically updating the patches. So that is the security aspect. So any system observability is to do with your uh, be it logs or metrics or traces. So uh, the system should have um, or when you plan a system, you should make sure that you can you 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 think about self healing too and see how you can automate to give some example you can have a read only parallel servers that are running so when there is a downtime you make sure that there is a self self healing automatic way where your users can connect to your read only system or there is a backup system that takes over so that it is see i talked about uptime we all we all know the systems have to be up and running if a system is going to go down if there could be any reasons for that what is the backup plan that I have? Can I do that automatically? So for each and every um, metric or trace or whatever we have for each and every segment, what are the other uh, uh, things that you can think of? So those are some things which you have to um, note down. So you know that your, uh, um, um, depending on your logs is growing, you may have to have some scripts automated and make sure that they are able to uh, heal it themselves. They are able to run and uh, um, make sure that restart the system so that the perform sometimes we may have to do that manually. We log into the system. Most of the times we restart the production system, the problems will be gone. Why don't we do that as an automation? So those have to be thought through and uh, the, um, what are the use cases? How can I bring in automation in all of those use cases and build it into the product itself? So when something happens, the self-healing is automatically done. So that's as part of the process can be brought into. Thank you very much, Chris, 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 Chris. If I'm not mistaken, you have something to add for this, <laughs> into, mm. into this discussion. I have some some opinions on uh, a couple of these things. And I think the first thing is my, my, my long experience with resilience and high availability is that self-healing most often is not the right answer. Um, if systems fail and you just restart them or try to relaunch them a lot of the time systems fail because of resource starvation and just restarting them basically means you are postponing the problem and it's going to happen again in the next couple of minutes hours days so everybody was saying like hey i want self-healing systems i typically go like mm, no you don't you probably want failover you want resilience you want other systems to take over but you don't want your failing system to restart itself and try to heal 
Um, so, so that actually is already my first remark. Um, the, the second part is like, to me, this isn't even a part of a, what is observability comes in there. This is basic system redundancy. Yes, if a system starts failing and you pull it out of the pool, then you can start to look at your observability tools and figure out why that one has been behaving badly. But if only one component of your stack, probably not toward the effort. Um, Honestly, when I saw, saw the question, I was like, hey, bullshit, bingo. This is like five words in a row that makes sense, but actually you have no real correlation. Uh, so figure out how to make your systems resilient. Figure out how to make them stable and uh, how to make them detect the failure and fail over to something else. And if you call that failover parts, self-healing, uh, fine by me, but that's not self-healing. That's just shifting your workload to something that works. Wow. Thank you. And uh, Amber, Larissa, anything you would like to add? Or we can continue with another question. So, and another question, it so happened that it's uh, specifically addressed to you. It's a quite a long one. So I'll, I'll show it in, in parts and then we will, uh, and if you, if you can help me with remembering the first part of the question and then I'll show the second part. So the question for Chris, is there any efficient approach to convince your SRE R&D management uh, that onboarding yet another observability tool from well-known vendor would solve, uh, would solve the fundamental flaws we had in our monitoring stack? Low level of automation, almost permanent alert fatigue, non-standardized, um, loosely coupled dashboards, etc. Of course, unmute myself. Uh, so, how to tell your manager that? Um, that's trivial. Show them the actual problems. Show them what's not working, and. Tell them why it's not working. Explain them the lack of automation. Explain them that you're looking at alerts which don't make sense and fix those problems. And why spend money on something that's not going to fix that if you have other problems to solve? If that doesn't work, point them to my talk. Point them to Bridget's talk about containers will not solve your broken culture. Point them to everybody who over the past decade has been saying Tools will not solve your DevOps problems. Tools will not fix your collaboration. Stephen mentioned that just in the previous question. I mean, I know it's hard for managers to stop listening to what Gardner has been telling them and all the other um, analyst firms that have no clue what they're doing and will figure that out in the next 10 years. But listen to your people. Um, the tools won't fix it. Buying another tool because some vendor has put it in its quadrant is not going to fix it. And Thank I do you. know that they'll still be buying from all of those sellers for the next decade, but. Well, thank you. Um... Okay, then we will start with another question. So this one is a little bit more general, but uh, this uh, track is um, this day is a free day for everyone who's interested in the um, developing as a DevOps engineer. And um, so we have some general questions and uh, we still would like to answer them because they're from 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 the um, from our audience. So um, so kind of general question, but uh, I believe it's worth answering. Are engineers the best candidates for becoming a DevOps engineer? I believe. What is a DevOps engineer? So this is the, this is the question. <laughs> the person didn't specify <laughs> what what does it mean. But uh, there's no so... such thing as a DevOps engineer. Do you put them next to the HL practitioner or the collaborator? It's not a job title. So it's a process, as uh, as we heard it many 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 times, I believe. So this would be the I believe this would be the answer. So it's anyone who practicing the operations or a developer who actually helps you to implement the, the practices that, uh, which are the, the fundamental practices of the, of the practice, <laughs> the DevOps. So yeah, thank you for, uh, for clarifying this. So advice, um, just a second. Hmm.
I'm not sure uh, which of the talks covered uh, this question because of, of my lags with the computer. I had to restart, so maybe I missed this one. So if anyone has, has anything to, to uh, add to answer to, to, to this question, can, please uh, let me know. Can, can I go back to the last question for just a moment? Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. So that, that's a question that I see, you know, you can change out the different job titles, you know, should this job title, are they best equipped for this new job title? And it really is a matter, it, that should not be the major discussion. Uh, the major discussion is, is what tools are you, what tools do you have? What skills do you have? What abilities do you have that you're going to transfer into this new role? Um, so you have some people that have been in one role for a very long time and they don't know or uh, they haven't been practicing uh, the skills and abilities that are going to be important for this new role. And so I see that, especially when you're talking about scrum masters, whenever you're talking about yeah, DevOps, um, when you're talking about agile coaches, they'll, they'll bring in other positions and say, ah, but this position would be better for this position. That's not necessarily the case. Um, what's more important is to look at the skills and abilities that the individual can bring and what value the person can bring to the new role. Um, so I think that that's a better way to frame that question or, or to frame that conversation if that's the conversation that you're having within your team. Uh, is not necessarily looking at the position that the person is in, but really more of the value uh, and the, the value that they can add to whatever new position that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so um, we have another question and I'm not sure I'll be able to uh, to pull it up really quick. Um, but this one is uh, connected with the uh, with the Steve's presentation. So Steve, if you don't mind. Um, so is there a resource that um, can be used to indicate all the to learn about all the threats that you covered in uh, in your presentation, besides the the slides that uh, that they can uh, find through the link that you've left us with. Um. Okay, so I um let me let me kind of back up and um, kind of describe some of the stuff which I was which I was talking about, and then I can I can point to some references for it. So um, some, some of the things which I covered in my talk were, for example, um, vulnerabilities in public repository, so, so open source supply chain attacks. Um, I cover a little bit about different like, like um, security threats, like um, uh, zero days and um, you know, things which are upcoming, kind of like the log4j exploit, which, which we talked about earlier in the, in the panel session. And um, you know, like, like ways which you should um, focus your your DevOps pipeline to make sure that you're you're identifying threats and addressing them quickly. Um, now, for for the specifics on on some of the open source security threats which I mentioned, uh, we actually did a couple blog posts on JFrog. One of them was around um, vulnerabilities which we found in um, PyPy. Another one in NPM recently, and in both cases we both um, let let the central repository know they took down the vulnerable packages um, and then we published the blog talking about what we what we discovered for for vulnerabilities and those are all published on the on the jfrog blog if you want to see more details about those exploits in detail um, but what i would say in general is that if you um, either have open source or commercial tooling which um, follows a, a a good vulnerability database like the um, um, national vulnerability database or another set of vulnerability disclosures, then um, that will help to notify you when you you depend upon a library which has a security risk or it, it has a dependency on a security risk by um, transitive dependencies. Um, and then getting back to how you improve your process, um, if you are doing the DevOps, uh, creating a DevOps transformation with your company, if you're improving the the communication and the tooling and the processes, then um, you can quickly address and try to mitigate these these threats in production before it actually becomes a secure a security incident. The later in the pipeline, the later in the software 
delivery pipeline where you identify vulnerable um, security vulnerabilities, the more difficult and costly it is to fix. So if you're if you're only discovering um, when you're in production um, or when your customers have received a release, like what happened with um, Solar Winds, where they impacted thousands of organizations with um, a vulnerable release, then that's much much more costly and difficult to fix than if you're identifying it upfront in development or in your testing stages when you you start depending upon a new library and you immediately are aware of it and there's also lots of great um, IDE plugin tools and um, source code repository scanners which will also tell you if you're using a vulnerable um, package. Thank you, thank you once again uh, for the uh, re. Um recapping what what we heard uh, during the session and um if i'm not mistaken the uh the article that we posted from you uh eight reasons for uh devops to use a non-binary a binary repository manager um this one uh also can help uh to um to address this question um certain way i would say probably yeah 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 absolutely and i think that's also on the jfrog blog which which has the other articles i mentioned okay and um let me uh check the uh, our chat um so hmm so the question uh actually super wide and um i mean <laughs> Uh, the question is, uh, I, I'm not sure if if uh, we can um, actually, um, we're going to uh, take sides, but the question is AWS or Azure? <laughs> so this is the last one from the chat. <laughs> so um, I don't know how to actually... Um, how to actually the choice. answer this? <laughs> how to answer this? But this is this is the question from the chat. The light, the, the last one. <laughs> so AWS, GCP, or is your question mark? I don't know Why how limit to limit the choice. There, there's more cloud suppliers out there than those three. Okay, so um, go uh, uh, as one of the famous uh, movie um, uh, personages from from uh, 200s uh borat sagdiv he said to his chicken go live your life go find it yourself <laughs> so so you can go and um actually uh find out that there are actually more than those three and i believe we will uh close this um this q a session with this uh with this question so as chris said as everyone said it's uh it's the way you build your process. It's the way you organize your team. It's the way you collaborate. It's, it's not the, the job title. It's not the, the fancy software that would solve everything. It's not the self-healing. It's not the, the automation. It's the collaborative approach between the operations, between the development, between the uh, your system administrators, between those people who do the architecture. So. Uh, Lots of lots of great stuff can come out from from a united team, from a collaborative team. And thank you once again, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chris. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rajalakshmi. Thank you, Amber, for uh, your awesome talks, for your awesome presentations. And um, especially thanks again to JFrog uh, for helping us, for actually supporting this community. And uh, and thank you. Uh, site 24 7 as well thank you zoho for uh, supporting us and uh we will pause for a quick uh for a quick break and, and then i will um switch places with amber amber will be our next moderator and um thank you for uh supporting me thank you for writing all the nice thing all the nice comments in in the private chat that um um and supporting me with this throughout this camera journey <laughs> thank you once again everyone and um i hope we will see you uh at one of the workshops that we're gonna have at the jfrog workshop or new religion workshop so um yeah talk to you uh soon or see you at the next edition of the uh of the devops summit this year this autumn thank you thanks thank you everyone
Thank you. The urgent push to go digital is accelerating the shift to cloud, using containers and Kubernetes to speed the pace of application delivery. But securing and operating these apps is difficult as legacy security tools can't see inside containers. For cloud teams already running in production, one fact is clear, seeing is securing. Cloud teams need to integrate visibility and security into their workflow. DevOps is not enough. It's time for Secure DevOps. Sysdig provides visibility and security to confidently run containers, Kubernetes, and cloud. With Sysdig's Secure DevOps platform, cloud teams can secure the build by flagging vulnerabilities and configuration issues, detect runtime threats, and respond using a detailed activity record, and continuously validate compliance. Sysdig is a SaaS platform built on an open source stack to accelerate innovation, enhance usability, and drive standardization. Sysdig's secure DevOps platform provides visibility to run Kubernetes, containers, and cloud with confidence. Make your move to secure DevOps with Sysdig.
And now I want to say a huge thank you to our friends and our sponsors at New Religion. Thanks once again for joining us and for sponsoring this event. And uh, just a couple of quick words about their API and their security test and scanner. What's so awesome about their product? So basically, it's built by developers for developers, and it helps you to integrate your security testing gives it into the hands of your developers and your QA engineers and DevOps engineers. And it built for developers, it produces no false positives, it's easy to use and fast to integrate with your CI CD. Uh, you can test your applications and um, API, so Prez, GraphQL, you name them. And you can do it on every build basically. So no manual validation, you don't have to go through the finance uh, once once again. It removes false alerts and uh, human bottlenecks that cripple your uh, rapid releases. It will spit up your releases. And also it's developer friendly. Um, it has the, the, the remediation guidelines are very simple. And you can start fixing your security issues. You can start fixing security um, very often now. It makes it so easy. So have a look into their awesome uh, trial. Uh, and also we will announce a hands-on workshop for where you will actually install it, register, you will receive a free uh, trial. And basically you will have a hands-on workshop. You will do the repo, you'll set up the scanning and in just a couple hours you will, you will learn some awesome tricks that you can use in your DevOps day-to-day -day practice. Thank you, New Religion. All right, thank you so much. So glad to be back here. We are finishing off the end of this conference today. Uh, so our next presentation is going to be uh, more of a pre-recorded session. Um, and that is from my friend, Daniel. Daniel is an API expert and a senior solutions architect at CodeCentric. And he is going to be telling us all about, um, all about how to use APIs today. So with that, we are going to go ahead and get started as we um, get out your pen and paper, ready to take some notes. Uh, and Daniel is going to uh, share with us his insights on how to use uh, and the development of APIs. Welcome to my talk about API ops. My name is Daniel Kautzart and I work for Concentric in Germany and I'm a senior solutions architect and head of API experience and operations at Codecentric. If you want to um, ask me questions, just use email, use Twitter, or you can find me on LinkedIn also, and we can chat around because it's not possible because I re pre recorded the talk and maybe we find some other ways to get into a discussion together. So, first of all, there are a lot of things around in this, in this world of um, operations and the DevOps and all, the, all kinds of stuff. So we, we talk about DevSecOps, we talk about uh, DevOps deployments, we talk about continuous things, integration, um, faster lead times and everything around this. But within this talk, there is no, I wouldn't say buzzword bingo. So there, we, we go into more deeper kind of things. So at first, because we are, we are doing this type of thing in this operational part, some would call it DevOps, but this is not the real case actually. So we, we just use the word operations and we, we have to get a step back and, and think about what is really about DevOps and all the things around. And the good part of it is to, to use the comms model, actually. The comms model differentiates the DevOps um, term, and we get more focus on what is really important to think about the things we have in regard to DevOps. So at first of all, we talk about collaboration. It's really important to be collaborative when you think about DevOps and all the things around. So we have to be very open to each other. So we, we're talking to persons in general. So everybody who is involved in the process has to be manageable, has to be available and, and so on. So it's really important to talk about people all the time. The second step is to talk about the automation. 
Yeah, and you normally have this thumb rule about 80 to 20, but it is really important to really think about what should be automated and in what case it should be automated. Then we should talk about the lean principles and processes when it's important to, to really think about that you don't over engineer, you don't have too much project management around. It should be really lean in principles and processes like we normally do in the, in the agile world. It's also important to, to talk about the measurement. What is our goal? What we want to measure all the time and, and really make sure that we are on track with our goal, actually. And the most important part is to really think about sharing, knowledge sharing or sharing things around with blog posts and everything like that. And even what I do at the moment is really important to, to really observe the ideas of DevOps, that you're really aware of what you're talking about and thinking about and, and, and share it with our people to make it available to everybody. And this is what I would like to do within this talk. So now we step over and, and go deeper into the topic of API ops. At first, we bring in API first. When you look at this uh, term, you have to really think about what, what it really means to you, you and your development and your product thinking and so on. But in general, you could think about that an API is the first and often only interface to users of your application. And API comes first before the implementation. So we don't have to think about the backends and, and all the stuff around regarding implementation. We really have to focus on the API. And the API should be described, documented, or even self-descriptive so that we are able to, to move on with this, what we have, like a contract or, or something like that. And we really are aware of the API. When we go further, we can talk about API design, maybe first. But we should focus on the designing part of the API. So what we need for this is we need a specification. In general, we talk about open API. When we look at asynchronous processes, we, we really think about async API. So we have this two specifications around, which make us able to, to really, yeah, design an API. When we look at an open API specification, in this case, we um, have the representation by stoplight elements. We see what is really important to the um, API in general. So we, we get the information about what is available, what is needed from us to really make sure that the wrong, the, the right response comes back to you. Open APIs, I wouldn't say it's not quite easier specification because it derives from the Swagger specification. So it started with two, with 1.2 in six, about nearly six, seven years ago. And now we're heading towards 3.1.0, which is not really at the moment adopted by many tools around. So you, you really, when you look at the tools regarding to the open API specification, you find a lot that are only supporting 303 at the moment as the latest specification, which is nearly two and a half years old. So we already or oh, I already talked about tooling. So let's have a look about the tooling side. There are many tools actually available and we have a good resource at the internet called openapi.tools where we find all what is needed to really provide or write good specifications. So we, we find something about testing, we find something about security, server implementation. And with this website, we are able to, to see what specification version is supported to make sure that we use the right tools at the right time. So we already talked about tooling. When we think about API ops, we saw GitOps on, on, the, on the slides before. So it's important to have something like a version control for this instance, or for this case, we use Git. We use maybe some kind of Git flow or GitHub flow. And we, we have to do no direct commits to the main branch actually. And every change to a specification has to be done 
by a pull request, even to the pipeline, to make sure that everything is tested apart from the main barge. And coming from the side of the version controlling, so maybe we talk about GitOps, but, but it's not really important to really talk about something like that. We have to think about the developer setup. So every developer should be able to provide the information needed for a specification in the best way he can he or she can do it. So at first we have to look at different EDEs, IDEs or editors. So we have to look at Eclipse, the JetBrains products. We have we could use Visual Studio Code, we could use Stoplight Studio, we could use something like Epicurio Studio or Insomnia. So there are a lot of tools around. So everybody should find the tool which fits, fits best to the situation he or she is in. And, and they really have to think about what is needed to bring the API project to the next step. And now we are, we are getting deeper into what is really what it really means like to think about a developer setup. So everything we do now, we do locally first. So when we think about the steps we would like to do with our specification, we all do it locally. So we start with validation. To use validation, it's needed that we install another tool, so which is called Spectral. It comes from Stoplight. And with Spectral, we are able to really validate and lint a specification. And when we do this, the spectral detects the open API specification version and we get a result back. Hopefully there are no errors or something like in it, but it could happen so that we are able to see at every time if the specification is really conformed to, to, the, to the standard actually. With a stop line, uh, with a spectral, we are able to yeah build our own rule sets, which makes it easier for us to really use this type of tooling in regards to ours uh, to our guidelines. So we can have a look at our guideline and see, okay, we are using this, which is aside from from the normal specification, and we have to really validate and lint this what we have in, in, in our guidelines. So with the root set, we are really able to get a one-on-one -on -one perspective of the guidelines. And now every developer sees directly what is wrong with the specification. And there is no instance between which is just reviewing all the stuff and saying, okay, you can't do this, you can't do that. And now we are really upfront and the developer is able to see what is happening with the specification. When we have validating and linting, we have to think about mocking because we want to check if the specification would really show the things we would like to expect and if what 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 really happens with the with the um, specification in in regards to a server backend and something like that. So with this, another tool from Stoplight, open source tools comes in, which is called Prism. Prism is just a mock-up or proxy server, which makes us makes us able to provide a mock of the specification in our local for our local environment. With this local environment of mock of a mock, we are able to do local testing. Local testing, you normally think about unit tests, which means we create a test suite based directly on the spec. Hopefully we use some, some BDD framework, but that's not the best and the fastest part of it. So when we have to think about the test suite on our own, on every time we have to look at the specification all the time, we have to really on a, a focus on the specification, but it's not really needed because we are able to yeah, create a test suite based on a Postman collection to make our lives even easier and our develop, API development much faster. So for this case, we use a tool called Portman and Portman is able to 
test an API specification and provide a Postman collection afterwards. For the testing, the created Postman collection is used, so we are able to see that the Postman collection really works out when we do a testing with our specification. And the Postman collection can be extended for several reasons, so that we want to do more integration testing and so on, so we are able to do this. And when we look at some setup, we see here that we have a Portman test running on our local environment. And we see that we are able to upload the collection to Postman, which is not needed in this case because we we have, we not using the post uh, the Postman web interface. And we see that the tests run through the four test four tests cases were created or free. And you see that they are able to that they will shown back and the conversation to the open to the postman collection was success, successful but this is just a normal testing this is locally which can also be un, run on a continuous integration environment and so we have to think about what is also needed to, to test an api we could think about yeah load testing which could be smoke load stress or soak testing and with k6 which is a tool developed from the grafana um, people so we are able to use k6 and make it make this test available also to to the broader audience and it's also quite fast and easy to to create a k6 test because we have a converter from the postman collection available so with this tiny JavaScript tooling, we are able to convert a Postman collection to a K6 test. You see it, it's just one line of code actually. And now we are able to, to use this little script test and run a mock server, then run, run this test with the mock server. And when we do this locally, we only have the scenario at the moment that we use one virtual user, but you can even do or use K6 to, to do a massive load test locally with, 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 our, with your local environment to see what really would happen with the specification or with, with the API in, in general. So this is possible at the moment. Coming back to the open API, we have to think about several other steps. So this was just the tooling side. And by the way, there are a lot of other tools available and I'm showing just a little a glimpse of them, actually. So we have to think more about the YAML JSON files. So when we look at the files, we see, yeah, YAML is more human readable. JSON is the more machine readable, readable part. But when we look on the, on the parsing side, it's more important that JSON is faster. When we parse a JSON file, it's even faster than yeah, parsing a YAML file. So when we look at this and coming back from, from the local setup to yeah, a global setup, so if, if we would like to bring this, what we use locally, into our um, continuous integration and continuous de delivery environment and really use a CI/CD pipeline, we really have to think about and say, okay, maybe we shouldn't use YAML we, sh we should prefer JSON because it's easier for all the tools around to really go through the specifications and make them uh, make uh, the results available in a faster time. So with this, we just need another handy tool to really convert YAML to JSON. That's not the biggest problem. And when we look at the structure actually, of the API specification. I normally use the tooling from the API handyman and it is available totally on the internet where we are able to see what is all about the specification. So we see here what, what possibilities we have, what probably properties we can use and so on. We can really go into deep and see what is really needed to fulfill all the things around the specification. And when we move into the path section, we see it's getting more and more complex. 
And with this type of reference, we could bring it in even more complication, so and even more complexity. So we see that we are able to really provide information, and we you can really click through it and see how the specification really is built upon. So it's really good for the purpose of uh, using the specification file in general, just to have a, even every time a look at the open API map. So when we think about the, the structure we, we saw earlier, we see that it's quite complex and maybe for reusable reasons and for a better overview, it might be good to use design libraries. So that means that we have to split the specification file. We could do it like the hard splitting method when we say, okay, one part of file per object, or we can do some kind of say, soft splitting where we say, okay, it really depends on the size of the whole document or the object where we do the splitting actually. So that it's easier for others to read the specification. And we can do this by using references. We can use local references, we can use remote ones, and we even can use URLs so that elements we are referencing to are not in the same repository so far. So that we are really able to, to provide this information because it's easier for others to, to understand what we are actually doing when, we, when they only see what is really needed for the specification so far. So, but when we do something like that, that like the splitting part, we need something else to rebundle the file to one again. So we need another tooling, so <laughs> not really this type of uh, new to us when we listening to the all the time to the talk so we have another tooling called swagger cle which is able to bundle this referenced specification files and present the specification in a whole which is needed to do this automation type of things when we look deeper into the open api specification we see that we can use open api extensions or sometimes I call them X objects to handle our own or even vendor needs. So, and these open API specific uh, extensions are supported on the root level, on the info level, at paths, operations parameters, responses, tags, and even security schemes. And with the specifications, we are able to do more things in reference to the idea of configuration as code. So we have to use this open API with its extensions. We maybe have to use something like AWS CloudFormation or AWS CDK or Azure ARM templates, or we use something like Plumi. When we move further in this in this ongoing we see that we have now a specification and we have here a specification which is used as an example and we go when we go further we see that we have here references and they are listed in the components part of the specification so we have to go a little bit deeper and see that we have here some reference to an x tag uh, to to an to an extend to an open API extensions for Amazon, so we want to be able to yeah provide integration information for the Amazon API gateway or the AWS API gateway. In this case, we want to provide a mock. And this is now happening for the configuration part within the open API specification. To upload the S buckets, uh, S3 bucket stack, we, we have to create another uh, a CloudFormation template. And for the, provide, the provisioning of the AWS API gateway, we have to yeah, provide another AWS CloudFormation template. And here we see how easy it now 
gets when when we use some some parts of the open api extensions we just have to provide the information where we can find the open api specification and with this on the on this stage we use here the whole configuration within the open api specification will be done by uploading the cloud formation template so it's in one way easier because we have one single source of truth because we are just using the open API specification to provide information for our infrastructure, which makes it easier to provide or to provision yeah, the infrastructure in some cases. When we look at some gateway vendors, they use their own tool sets regarding configuration or infrastructure as code. So when we look at Kong and we, we have some type of things called DAC, we, we can use Insomnia CLE called INSO to, to make sure that, that what we did at for AWS within the specification will also happen there. And when we look at TIG, we have something like TIG Sync. So the idea is really to, to have deployable infrastructure based on your specification. So that we are able to provide gateways, portals, hubs, registries. Now we can bring this into an automation type of thing. For this, we have to use API first, a Git process, a well structures and, and formed API specification. We have to think about automated viol uh, validation. We have to think about automate testing and we have to think about automated development for the relevant infrastructure to bring this in a more picture in a more in, in, in a picture we have here a little diagram which shows that we have a design phase we have the CICD phase and within the CICD phase the whole end-to-end -end automation starts so we have this version control and we have some processes around and with the CI CD, we are able to deploy the information towards API gateways, API portals, etc. So this is the way we really will move on and make sure that everything will work as possible. So maybe you have one question that you think about, do we have to build our own framework for this? No, it's not really important to build a framework because we normally use tools, tools in, in reference to the infrastructure we use. So when we think about AWS, we have this specific AWS tooling and so on. So it's, it's mostly important to really think about what it costs in, in regards to, to do this automation type of thing and uh, to rethink about not to, to have no vendor lock in, in reference to something like an API gateway or an API portal and so on. So to make sure that everything works quite smooth out of the specification. So we saw a lot in the last 25 minutes, but there are still some missing parts. We didn't talk about building SDKs. We didn't talk about security. So no OSAP uh, API top 10. No best security best practices. We even didn't talk about policy or policy as code. So we didn't see something like OPA and Sentinel. But this is something you, you see, it's getting more and more complex and this is already yeah, planned for the future to do another talk in in regardless in regard to the topic of API ops, maybe with a sec more security focused aspect. To give you a short wrap up, um, you find everything I re already talked about on the blog post at my company Codecentric, where I work for, and um, you ju can just use the link. You find all the English uh, written blog post of my, myself and. Maybe have some fun, ask questions, and maybe we get in contact. So no Q&A. So all I can do is just to say thank you for your time and see you soon, hopefully in person someday. All, all right. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for that great, uh, session on APIs and 
Uh, I don't know about you, but there's several notes that, uh, that I was thinking about how I can apply these tools to, uh, to our work that we are doing at my company. So um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. All right. So as we are moving on, looks like we are on to our next presentation. Uh, we have the CTO of Managed Services uh, at Ethico coming on. Uh, we're going to learn about GitHub Actions in the cloud. Uh, so this is going to be a really great talk uh, on some real action steps we can take uh, in applying GitHub to the cloud. So it looks like we have Kaylee with us. Um, maybe. Let me look. Make sure he's here. Yep. All right. I see you here. Ready to go. So let me add you onto the stream. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you again. Nice to meet okay. you. Welcome. Uh, welcome. We're glad to hear your presentation. Yeah, I hope I stay in time. I have way too much material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, well, that's good. It's better to have too much than too little. And I'm sure that uh, the participants can uh, connect with you afterwards for any further conversation as well. Yes, please write in your LinkedIn request uh, uh, that you met me here. Or so because otherwise I play, press decline. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, you said that you're going to be pressed for time. I'm going to give you one minute uh, extra, and I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. Yes. Thank you. And now you should be seeing my screen, hopefully. And let's get started. Um. So we don't see your screen just yet. Let oh, me... Welcome to my talk about API. Oh, that's not it. Um, oh, do my. you want to go... Ah, you here. see this screen? Okay. Ah, here we go. Ah. Now I can see it. All right. Can you see the slide show? No. Yes. So we see we see the full screen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, yes. Hello. I'm Kalle Sirkestal. I work as the CTO of Managed Services for Efficode Finland Helsinki. Uh, I've worked on the 24-7 operations and customer service for us uh, for the last seven years, seven and a half years. Uh, my responsibilities lie mostly in DevOps and cloud processes, and I've been lately working on huge GitHub and GitLab cases, uh, around 12,000 users minimum in the instances that I've been working with. Uh, I've been working with cloud for ever since AVS came out because I didn't have anywhere else to put all of the services that I was running during those days. And uh, my hobbies include sailing and reading books. Uh, I read about 100 books per year at this at the current rate. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about uh, developer experience hidden inside GitHub. So I'm talking about GitHub actions in cloud. But in reality, nobody should care about this. Because according to research by DigitalOcean and by us, uh, what create developers want is to create and release an application. They don't want to worry about the DevOps. They don't want to worry about uh, doing all of the infrastructure stuff. They want that application that they've been working on for hopefully one day, but in reality, six months or so. And they want that to be visible to the end users so they can get, start getting the feedback. And quick GitHub Actions will allow us to deploy an application in the same day. Uh, currently, in 2022 now, but 2021, a lot of organizations were researching that uh, currently, uh, in these days, we can re deliver. It's no longer about delivery. It's no longer about being able to deploy. Most organizations, so over half, can deliver at least once per week. They can release a new application once per week or version of the application. Uh, elite performers, like you can have, probably have read, AVS, GitHub, Azure, so on. They release thousands of times per day. It's uh, due to the development of the, uh, DevOps, and it's due to improvement in the developer experience. The faster we can get the response back to developers, the faster they can work on fixing things. This has allowed us to deploy and release to Mars. We are no longer subjects of uh, working only in the global Earth that we have been, we are no longer even in the atmosphere. We have been releasing software to places where humans have not gone. We are capable of releasing software faster than ever. That means that we, every time we can and should think about that why are we not deploying the releases that we are making. 
because we are capable of doing it to Mars. Why would we not be able to do it on your servers? Uh, over 56% of uh, companies are now using only public cloud. So that's why we are talking about cloud today. Uh, it's very much and very heavily required in the current day. Uh, over 84% of companies are running containers in production. So if you're not running containers in production, you are not, uh, you are 16 per, in the 16 percentile of the companies. That's quite low rate. People who have been deploying to AVS have adopted servers. That's visible from the 50% adoption rate of servers. But there are negatives from all of this. We waste around 30% of the cloud spend that we spend, meaning that from the 56% of the companies that are using public cloud, all of them are paying average of 30% too much. Uh, the 47% of us have not defined continuous security responsibilities. That means over half of you listening have not told that, hey, this is how we do security in our company. And in addition to all of this, we are seeing an increase of 10% per year of valid bots, probably last year even more due to Lock4J. But in ideological world, we are seeing a 10% increase year to year on bugs found by hackers. White hats in this case. So probably black hats have found 20% more. This makes it kind of like horrible because industry leaders, they are moving faster. So if you're releasing 9,000 times per day, for example, uh, I remember reading that number at one day on Google. It's probably way faster nowadays. Uh, that means that the leaders that are running, say Google, etc., they are running so much faster that if you release once a month, right, let's say once a week, you're releasing, uh, let's say it's ten thousand, so you're releasing seventy thousand times slower than these guys. If you're releasing daily, you're still releasing. 10,000, uh, one in 10,000 that they are. That's how much faster they get feedback from their customers and their effects on gold. And that means that most organizations stagnate. So these readers keep going on. And in the old days, we thought, hey, we are going to catch up to them. They're going to release their technologies. They're going to release all of this. We, ju we just have to wait. And they've been doing that. But the problem is that when you get the user experience that much faster, when you get the feedback constantly, you're going to be running circles around us. Because if you're running 10,000 times faster, you're getting feedback 10,000 times faster. You're making metrics. You know what the application is doing. You leave behind everybody else to the another mountain. So what do, what do we need to do? We need to stop being afraid of releasing. We need to be stopped afraid of the CI CD pipelines that we build and push forward, push away from the uh, aim of mediocrity and aim towards the uh, mountain tops, aim to be one of the top dogs. So, yes, I tried to stay slow, short. I could be talking one hour from those, but sadly, I don't have enough time to talk about the research in DevOps. Uh, GitHub's current offering answers to version control. Code analysis, binary storage, automated deployment, artifact scanning, which I don't have a logo in there, uh, CI, CD, document management, and requirements and project management. In addition, it integrates fantastically to cloud, where we get to. Idea today is to discuss a little bit about how it does all of this. Uh, if you have, and as this is a beginner uh, thread, uh, never seen GitHub Actions, they look kind of like this. So you write a name for the workflow. We'll have an example from github.com soon. But you get uh, a name to workflow. And then you define when it triggers. This one triggers on git push. So that means that every time someone does a git push, it would run this job. And in this case, it would run a build, which makes a name, <laughs> hello word action, appear in your build. So you can see it on the right side of the screen. Hero word action is visible. Uh, it runs on Ubuntu latest. So we can define, for example, Mac, Windows, etc. 
and it has a step called uh, that we call from actions checkout. So that is definition for GitHub repository actions, where there is a checkout repository. And it allows us to use action A, which allows us to print out my name, and it prints out Smona. So this is a GitHub example, very simple, but it allows us to get started on seeing how it affects things. Uh, you can see that it uh, activates on push, and it uh, prints out Mona, basically. We'll check it out in GitHub soon. Uh, GitHub, uh, we'll get back to this. So we can actually go to GitHub now. So uh, I'm going to go for a bit more complex GitHub pipeline. And hopefully, you can see it. Let's try to get a bit larger. So this is a node CI build. And it triggers on push. So it still does the on push. And it runs a job, uh, action upload artifact master. So if we were in audience, I would be asking now, what are you do? What would this do? And someone smart would shout, probably you, that hey, it pu pushes an artifact into our uh, webpack because you can see webpack artifacts. Yay! Well, yes, we push artifacts to uh, our, so to say, webpack artifact storage. So if we go and look at the job, we have a binary released in the release station uh, releases. I don't. It's probably been removed because I haven't run this in a while. Uh, that's, <clears throat> yep, let's not get uh, caught off on my uh, screw ups. Uh, we run the job on Ubuntu latest, and the idea is to have a checkup uh, action. Once again, same repository, same stuff to get up Ubuntu latest, have the packages we need. And then we would run an npm install and build webpack. And we would do it exactly the same way as you would do it on your own machine. Once again, allows us to get the building going fast. Then we can define test runs. Uh, once again, very simple. Ubuntu latest. Uh, we can define these on top level also, but we have I have defined here on every run what I want to do. And I'm defining that hey, let's download the artifact that we just uploaded to the up upload artifact location. So we got the artifacts that we deployed here. So the builds we made. And we got those down here from the public repository. And we're going to do an NPM install and test. So we don't want to build here because of the, if we build here, we have to build three times, uh, two times, because I'm running uh, tests on a matrix node. So GitHub Actions allow you to run on matrix nodes. And this allows you to do tests on multitude of systems at one time. And you get the feedback in one place. We need all of this to get uh, to the cloud. Uh, wait for it. Uh, it. The idea here is to get a node version, see where it's going, and see what happens if we run it on multitude of nodes. And here we would run a normal NPM install and test for our package. And this would return us an action that I have broken. But here we can see that it has run four jobs. So it has run on Ubuntu, Windows 2016, and Ubuntu latest and Windows 2016. And we can see how it ran. And we can see what happened. Uh, I have a new laptop, which means that I haven't signed in to GitHub which is why I can't see the logs. And this will be a problematic thing, which means that I need to go to the other material anyway. But idea was that I would be doing a live demo, which I can't because I don't have my GitHub uh, <laughs> credentials on this machine. Sorry about that. Uh, but the idea being that, hey, we set up the uh, job, we run an action, we build the system once and deploy it multiple of times and be, uh, test it on all of those at one time. Then that would be how we got GitHub Actions running. So I would have wanted to run this workflow, which is more of the in, more interesting workflow. So this is uh, how to deploy to Azure with GitHub Actions. Uh, this is ready defined GitHub uh, package from uh, GitHub. It allows you to get the workflows. 
And I've been using here uh, deploy production and deploy staging and spin up destroy. And this would be the point I ask you, uh, what do you think is the difference between deploy to staging and deploy to production other than where it deploys? Pretty simple. In staging, we do it uh, do the build on pull request. So as you can see, we do a pull request on labeled. So it needs to be labeled. And we would be uh, pushing things to Docker registry so we can get them to Azure. Versus in uh, production deployment, we build it based on branch. So here we use push branches main. And this is basically how you would define on GitHub deployment uh, or build uh, system based on branches and security groups, etc. cetera. Uh, basically, you need to also define, which I would show if I had logged in, uh, but you would have a secrets location where you would place the secrets, uh, which are variables that you need to define. So here I have defined my uh, public information, and then I have a few private variables that are visible here. Secrets, Azure credentials, and those are defined in GitHub secrets, same as secrets GitHub token. And these prevent me, you from seeing ever, or me from seeing ever after putting them there, what I'm running, which is a good thing, because now this can be a public repository and you can go and git clone it and you can deploy your own stuff to my amazing web app, but you can't because you don't have the secrets. Uh, idea is once again, you build the thing, you do the Docker image building for the same NPM that we just checked. Uh, so same steps going on. We push the NPM to our GitHub packages. So here is the GitHub uh, storage. So if you haven't done GitHub uh, package storage, that would be how. And then we would start running deploy to Azure. So GitHub has a very nice feature, which is that it runs natively on Azure. So uh, most of the stuff you can do from GitHub immediately into Azure. So it is basically auto-integrated there heavily. And that allows you to do very simple stuff like Azure client here, and we can do a Docker login for our GitHub repository, and we can deploy a web app container. So here it would do the web app deployment using the Azure clients that we provided and deploy our Azure uh, web page to the Azure client. It would be fantastic to show you how it's happening, uh, <laughs> but I don't, I'm not logged in, so I can't run the job, uh, sadly. Then we want to do a spin up. So every time we have a, a table going, we want to actually remove also the environment because we don't want to keep running on environment that we are not using. We want to keep running in an environment that we want to test and see the functions. So we have a job setup. So there is the environment and we create the steps to do the Azure login once again. There is the tier up. So it checks is the environment up and running. It checks that the environment is up and running. So this also spins it up. Uh, and we create the web apps. Fantastic. And then on destroy Azure resources, which happens after the pull request has been defined, destroy. So this is a label we would change on the pull request. It deletes all of the environment so you don't have to see it again. And how it looks like is here that we would be deploying the environment. And it would be then just us changing the variable to destroy the environment, allowing us to get the feedback immediately. Yes. Uh, I would like to go more in depth, but uh, as I can't show you demos, I want to point out a few other things that you have to activate when you start going here. So as said, uh, GitHub has secrets. GitHub has also security modes that allow us to detect when you put the secrets on the wrong place. So if you put an Azure uh, secret to your GitHub repository, 
it will complain. And the idea is that you should have this online if you don't yet. So GitHub security features are something that you should enable no matter what. Uh, they do cost more if you are on a private repository, but if you use a public repository, these are free for you to take into use. And I highly recommend them. For example, uh, we have the Dependapod in integrated for every ethical open source project. Uh, we use the, that to heavily figure out what dependencies are broken or what dependencies are uh, vulnerable for different attacks. And it makes us a pull request immediately after there is some uh, vulnerability available and shows us that, hey, you should update this and this is how you do it. It's not bulletproof, but it allows us to get started. Uh, it also tells us what it has changed, as pull requests usually do. And it also tells from code QLs, uh, libraries, what is the CV and why is it important to fix? And what do we need to do? It also shows us which commit it has been detected and where it is currently residing. So we can start figuring out what do we do. A lot of information very easily available in pull requests makes a developer's life easy. Uh, there is a high amount of information here, so you probably will end up just reading the recommendation part. Maybe example if you are if you don't know how to upgrade the package or there is something important there that you need to change. For example, here we have a cross-site cross forgery, uh, requ a request forgery uh, disabling, so preventing that. And it is basically that you need to add on check that, hey, someone is trying to do it, so let's not disable it, let's enable it. So here you can see an example where it has been disabled by force. Not a good practice. Uh, another feature, if you have already used GitHub security, and I hope you have seen all of the bad things or good things about GitHub Actions, is the GitHub Copilot. Uh, so that allows you to write code faster, but it has its problems, of course. So you shouldn't just trust the code. You should read what it <laughs> provides you and debug it before going to production with it. To quote my friend uh, and good co-worker, yes, GitHub Copilot, it's amazing until you deploy the code and figure in production that you have a typo. Uh, usually it doesn't have such things. Uh, you should also not always create something new. You should do and consume services that are available. So in this case, for example, uh, GitHub Actions, there is a large amount of marketplace applications available for it. Uh, we at Efficode also released one, which is, is very fantastic. And you should go and find those actions and use them instead of trying to write your own every time, as someone else is probably maintaining already the feature that you need. Uh, if you haven't yet, as we were talking, Deploying faster is in, uh, a lot more important nowadays. So if you can, and if you're developing your own software and are available, you should be enabling Canary releases. So I would have had a demo of that also with GitHub, but sadly, yeah, let's not go there. Uh, enabling Canary releases uh, enables lower barrier to entry. So what it means is that you have two environments running and you upgrade one first and you see it working and then you upgrade the other one, allowing you to uh, see if something breaks first. So you can constantly keep update, uh, upgrading the environment and getting releases faster because you see if something starts to break. And when something starts to break, you can start rolling back. Uh, and you, as we were looking, we had Docker containers. So hopefully you would be using containers. So maybe not Docker, but some containers, and you would be able to roll back those containers. You would be able to see, oh, that's where we need to roll back to. And with cloud, you can even roll back the database. And the last thing that I want to state from all of the slides is to, it's easier to blame technology for your problems than the culture. And that's very much true. So. No matter what CI you go, or if you don't use GitHub Actions, or if you love GitHub Actions like I do, uh, it's easy to blame technologies for 
the problems that you have. I can easily tell you how bad Jenkins is or, I, or how bad something else is uh, or how amazing Jenkins is in correct hands. But in the reality, it's all about the communication. So uh, as shown here, the GitHub Actions idea is to get you to communicate in pull requests. Its idea is to get the feedback faster to you. It doesn't save you uh, if you don't communicate already in the team, but it does help give you the tools and enforcements to discuss within the team. So it allows you to see a lot faster where you're going. For example, in here, in Epicode, uh, repositories, we've been uh, running on, where is it? Um, I think it's here. Yes. So in here, we run on CI, CD check on different jobs. So we have a test, test jobs running on push and pull requests to show us that, hey, this library that we wrote is available and testing things. So that allows us to see that, hey, we are using two different Python versions and we are using tons of robot framework versions. And it creates a matrix out of that, allowing us to save time and save uh, effort by seeing, <coughs> do we actually, does it actually work on the platforms that we support currently? On Windows and Linux, allowing us to tell our users, also Mac OS, but yeah, Mac OS, it doesn't, everybody uses it on the desktop. Yeah, but the idea being that, hey, uh, we get the feedback when, before we start the pull request review, that, hey, it works, it doesn't. Leading to a situation where we don't have to worry that, hey, do we actually uh, let it through? But we, we see, hey, it worked. So we get the history, we get the information, and we know that our testing works. So testing our testing, so to say. And here you can see even more of the, like you have 18 jobs completed on Linux. And it's uh, 18 more jobs on macOS and 18 more jobs on Windows without you doing anything else than changing one wire variable on your uh, GitHub repository. I was hoping to find another repository, but I think I don't have it here immediately. So sadly, I can't show it. Uh, I think it's in an, another organization. Uh, in there, I would have had a visibility on how to do Heroku deployments. So uh, we've been building on Another tool that allows us to deploy faster through GitHub Actions. So deploying your repository, GitHub Actions, and Heroku code so that you can immediately start deploying to Heroku. And that's the kind of gist of it. You don't have to use the GitHub for Azure. You don't have to use GitHub Actions for one thing. They support AWS, they support Google Cloud. Same techniques I was showing and be implemented, for example, AP, API Ops that you were seeing before. You can integrate those commands that are being run on command line on your pipeline immediately. And I think I'm running out of, uh, I'm, I can now stop here and be sad that I didn't have my uh, accounts, but as there is a next person probably starting, uh, I'm done, hopefully. Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope I'm not start stopping too early. Yeah, lots of material that is not available without logging in. <laughs> Let's see. If my keychain works, I might be able to log in. Yeah, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Here, let me turn that on so that you can see me. Thank you so much. Um, I am looking here. I think I want to say that you have a little bit of extra time. Um I'm, I'm checking I, that if I can walk into my GitHub. My... <laughs> I think that maybe no. Okay. Okay. okay maybe no. Um, okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. Clearly a lot of information. And uh, like you said it in your, like, like you said in your presentation, there's a lot more information. We're really just scra scratching the surface. So um, if people want to reach out to you and have further questions, 
Uh, they, of course, can ask in the chat and reach out to you here. Is there another way that they can reach out to you as well? Uh, yeah, sure. So my email is kaga.circusalo at ethical.com. Uh, I guess it's in chat. I can type it. Great. Okay, awesome. Well, again, and, oh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, and I'm available in LinkedIn and whatever else. Uh, I don't use my Twitter profile, so there I don't answer anymore. Okay. <laughs> All right. That sounds great. Um, well, thank you so much again for uh, taking the time to share with us. And uh, of course, look forward to the continued conversation. Um, yeah. Look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we are going to continue moving on in our program for today. Uh, so next we have Alejandro. Um, he is with us and he is going to be sharing uh, some different tools about DevOps, DevOps explained with Minecraft. So if you're looking for a bit of DevOps and a bit of gaming put together, I'm really excited for this uh, presentation. Uh, Alejandro is the DevOps manager for KMMX in Mexico, and he is going to be sharing with us today a bit of DevOps and Minecraft. So hello, Alejandro. Great to have you with us. Okay, I'm very honored to be here. Hi, Amber. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Well, uh, I am so excited to see this presentation. <laughs> I, I love gaming with Minecraft. I love uh, DevOps. So I'm excited to learn about the two together. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get you, uh, let you take off. Yeah, thank you very much. Just give me a sec to, to share my slides. Uh, okay. It's uploading the oh no, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, it happens. <laughs> oh, here we no. go. Okay, <laughs> there we go. All right, <laughs> we, can, we can see your screen now. We can hear you. Um, so, uh, is there is there anything else that you may need from me? No, no. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you, Alejandro. You are welcome. So, very honored to be here. I am Alex, um, the App and DevOps Manager, living in Mexico. So. Buenas noches, buenas tardes. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about DevOps, but in a different way, it, it's explained with Minecraft. This is because this is a project that we are working on and it's about, yeah, trying to explain DevOps in a different way. You know, at, at the end, Minecraft, Minecraft is another piece of software. So that's what, we are trying to do so it's also part of my a, a book that we are going to publish hopefully at the end of this year uh, so well this is a quick survey just three questions if you want to help me <clears throat> so well this is about me and my best project definitely <laughs> so i think that Almost everyone knows about Minecraft, you know, Minecraft was uh, this revolutionary game, very basic but important idea about these blocks and made the, the, a whole world, uh, keeping safe of creepers. So, well, you know, this is um, Marcus Nouch. He was the creator of, of Minecraft. Um, as you may know, Microsoft boy Mojang, <laughs> So it's it's that's why we are using Minecraft. I mean, we can just any excuse to to explain the Bobs, but Minecraft is very popular. We use a lot. We like Minecraft. You know, devs are are gamer gamers. So 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 that's why there is no other reason because it's fun. <laughs> it's pre very popular. So I, I am going to review this this couple of slides pretty quick because you know is if you are here talking about the bobs you know 
what is the bobs and you know there is a lot of definitions no one written on a stone but you know we have like this definition that the bobs is about culture where people regardless of title or background work together to imagine develop deploy and operate a system so i stick to this definition but <clears throat> For sure, DevOps is about cloud native. There is a correlation about, you know, it's, when we talk about DevOps, we, we think about cloud native applications. So, 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 well, we are trying to connect the dots. So if we think about the evolution of software deployment, so we started with, you know, physical servers, so virtual machines, I can say that we are moving from containers to, to serverless. It, this technology is changing radically the way that we, we are making software. <laughs> so what is this all, uh, all about? Well, this experiment is, is just about, you know, making software, but, you know, ma making our own models on top of Minecraft, but trying to use the, you know, the API, um, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, Microsoft, the, the cloud. In this case, uh, uh, we use Microsoft Azure and Datadog for monitoring. No? So it's all the ingredients of the whole DevOps journey. So, well, the step one was to, to containerize our application, our Minecraft world. So look at me, there was a lot of we, we can find a lot of mm, images. So you just can do a quick search on Docker Hub. And well, that's as simple as that. We, we found a couple of Docker images. So we started to, to the, you know, to have um, very useful containers to run up our Minecraft world. But this was not the, the particular one because we need to install other components, you know, to so in order to run our JavaScript models. So we need to do a little adjustments to, to the to this image. But well, you know, Docker is very popular. We use the to make things faster. We use the, the Docker Compose just to, as you can see in the in the slide, we have these um, services. We expose the port. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Well, we set the volume, you know, to to have data persistent on our local. So, so that, but it's 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 pretty straightforward just to containerize the Minecraft world. But because we like containers, no, and DevOps is about containers for sure. So it allows developers to save time. And, and don't worry about the underlying infrastructure. You can run this image on top of a Mac, a Windows, or a Windows machine, or a, a Linux uh, ma machine. So we, this solved the, the typical or the traditional problem that it works on my machine. So we can deploy fast and easy for sure. So yeah, you have seen this image a lot of a lot of times for sure. So it's running, it's as simple as that. The difference that I can run Minecraft on my machine, but this is inside of container. So I, we can make a lot of nodes in, with a Kubernetes. So we can have the, a huge infrastructure uh, of Minecraft. So <clears throat> We need this different version uh, of Micron version because uh, there there is this version at Bedrock, but Bedrock refers to any current non-Java edition of the game. So so we still are using the Java edition. So that's why in the Bedrock edition, uh, JavaScript runtime is already there, so you don't have to do any more. But because we are using the Java edition, we have to do a little uh, setup. So we have to 
to run this SPGOT component that is an open source Java project that let users run the, their own Minecraft server. So if you want to know more about this particular component and you want to, to do something else, you know, using Minecraft, you, you can um, you can read this book as a reference. <laughs> so there is a lot of servers running with, with SPGOT. So besides the, the SPGOT server, uh, we we need to install another component that is the 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 the, the script craft that is a plugin for for Minecraft. So we can write JavaScript to run it in on on Minecraft. So this is just the I am showing here in these slides the the commands how to install. We are going to share the the presentation if anyone want to review it later. So at the end, we, uh, <clears throat> I ended with this Docker file, you know, um, ju just to have everything documented and, and just to save time. Uh, so in, in just running this only Docker file, I can do the, the, the whole process, I mean, from from pulling the image to install everything and to run and have my my Minecraft board. So at the end, I I ended. We mounted a volume to perceive data, so we can make our own JavaScript files. So we can do something like that. No, if you see, we can have this. Um, we have this terminal inside Minecraft, as you can see here in the slide. Uh, I am using JS, and I can do something like that just to to show that we are uh, using javascript no i like javascript that that's why but you can use python or java of course uh so so once we have the all the the, the whole setup inside the containers you know, we can start writing our own models so so it's very fun because you can make with a couple of lines uh, i don't know and um an army of creepers, a castle, a sphere, <laughs> a lot of crazy things. That, mm, mm, other way, you have to build it block by block, and it can take you uh, a lot of time. So, so when, especially for for kids, you know, <laughs> these powers, uh, you know, they they feel pretty happy <laughs> because they can do a lot of things with just a couple of lines. And in this case, we. This is something like that that we can do with just a couple of lines and adding our own models. So well, that was the the developer part. So now to the operations part or the operational part. So the deployment, well, we use um, Azure just because well, <laughs> just because there are no particular reason. So so well, but. We want to orchestrate our whole infrastructure, so you know we can have ten or twelve or one hundred nodes with the Docker uh, uh, Minecraft uh, image. So of course we are using um, uh, Kubernetes. I mean it's like the most popular uh, orchestration technology. So before that we have to use a, a Docker Hub. In this case. We are using Docker Hub, which is a public image. Anyone can can pull it if, if you want. So I have the 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 image in um, in Docker Hub. So so once we have the the image on Docker Hub, we can just call it. So we need to well, and this is not a a natural tutorial, but you have to create the resources. Not just to log in to Azure, of course, and and we have we have to push the the, the image to Azure. No, so so it's the, the the whole journey that that's the idea of. At the end, we are trying just to add our own models with JavaScript pretty easy and 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 to have it on a production server. That that's the whole idea of this uh, whole, whole I can say end to end a tutorial or platform that we are making. So we have the, 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 the container on Azure. 
So once we have our Docker container on, we proceed to set up an Azure Kubernetes services. So uh, to have this Kubernetes cluster as a service, agent node creator or deleted on demand. So we can, well, of course you can use the, the terminal, you know, connected to, connect to, the, to the Azure. Or there is a graphical user interface if, if, if you want to use that. So we can connect the, the cluster using kubectl, you know. So you get the credentials, as you can see here. And so you have all the, the full power of Kubernetes. So, so you start, you know, ha having uh, the cluster so you can uh, grow on demand the, the, the infrastructure or auto healing, you know, the auto healing feature is pro pro pretty powerful. So that's about uh, uh, about having the, the, the infrastructure so everyone can see the, the project running. So we have the, the cluster, the, the manifest file to deploy the application. It's, it's just like that. <clears throat> So at the end, I end with this uh, YAML, you know, YAML is like the most popular configuration files, you know, to, to provision the, the infrastructure. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, now at this point, I have the, 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 the Kubernetes cluster running on, on Microsoft Azure. So, but, it was a lot of steps. I mean, there must be a way and a different way, a simpler way to do that. And there is. And of course, we, maybe you have heard about the infrastructure as a code. So we have a lot of options like theft, like a Terraform, of course, that uh, I like Terraform. So, so well, it's, you know, this is like this, uh, other script. So um, we create the configuration files using the HCL syntax. So, so it's something like that. No, so it's, it's exactly the same steps that we already did. But you know, this is you know you, you keep the, the 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 steps in the configuration file, so it's um, it's faster, very much faster. <laughs> so you have to make this these plans, you know, you know. So you once you are pretty sure that everything is correct, so you apply the, the Minecraft plan. So so this is our Terraform commands, so, you know, plan, apply. So this way I can do the same thing. That, I mean the setup, but just in, in one single step. So this is just a verification verification on natural portal. And yeah, we have our Minecraft running uh, in, in on Azure, no? So, so it is a pretty that is like the difference, no? From Minecraft desktop on my, on my desktop, from Minecraft running a container on Docker container, but in my desk in my local, to have the Minecraft on a container orchestrator by Kubernetes, but in the cloud on the cloud, no? The, the, now we are running. Um, Minecraft on Azure, on Microsoft Azure. So that's them. So we have everything stopped. Of course, well, uh, I, I omitted a, a step that this was just to the, um, to set up a, a, a domain, but well, this is just some other details. <laughs> but the, the final step, you know, once you have your, your whole project on, on production server, you need to start monitoring. This is pretty important part because, well, you know, the, the, the project is alive. So you need to see what is going on with the project. So in this case, we are using Datadog. There is a lot of tools uh, for monitoring and observability. I, I like to use Datadog because it's pretty straightforward and the Azure integration is, is already there. So it's just about two or three clicks and some dashboard customization. And yeah, it's, it's as simple as that. So just provide the project details and start monitoring. So we have already a lot of components uh, so we can uh, add any dashboards. 
customize the dashboards and, and that's it. So um, you can see the almost instantaneously the monitoring resources. So, so, so yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of integrations. I mean, if you want to, of course, use Datadog, but to send notifications with, I don't know, with a Slack or Telegram or by mail, of course. So there is just a couple of clicks away from that. So you can integrate with other uh, technologies. So we, you, well, you, you don't see a lot. You can't see a lot of information in this dashboard because it was a, a pretty new project. But well, you can set up the, uh, a lot of dashboards about the, the the load balancer, about the virtual networks, about, about every, every di di digital heartbeat of the of the project you can you can see. In, uh, so setting alarm is part of course of DevOps or, or, or the CR activities, of course. And this is the, the, the cherry and the cake. So you have this monitoring tool, Datadog, but you know, um, the chaos engineer is pretty awesome because it's part of our activity. So to to, to, act, to act, it sounds crazy to attack our own systems. So, so uh, there is a lot of tools, of course, to, um, to implement uh, chaos in our own systems, like like Gremlin, uh, the Gremlin and Datadog integration is pretty straightforward. So, so it's pretty easy to do it. And I mean, it, it sounds crazy to attack our system, I mean, on production, our projects and servers, but it's, well, you know, that that's the way that a lot of companies are doing that, like Netflix, of course, but was one of the pioneers of Caius Cows engineer. So, so you can, of course, you have to make a, like a hypothesis. Um, based on this hypothesis, uh, you start, there, there's a different types of attacks that you can, you can run on, on your projects and servers. But this is really cool. <laughs> Maybe you think that you have a pretty solid system and, and at the end you, you figure out that that's not the, the reality. So, so, well, this is part of the, well, this is part I, I like to, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so as you can see, we have the whole journey from, from code to, to containerize, to, to provide um, uh, infrastructure to orchestrate, to have the, the project, the whole project on the cloud, just to start monitoring with, with Datadog. And even that uh, step further is, you know, doing the, these defend activities with Chaos Engineer. So, well, I think that this is what I have. I don't know if I, it takes me, I have a lot of time, I think. So, so well, if you have any question or comment. <laughs> it was like, like, we, we can talk about every step in, in more detail, but well, it's, it was just the, the, about the whole experiment and when and I think I just wanted to, what we are doing is this learning platform to to show the whole process, no? I think that's the idea, that's the idea from front end, you know, from writing JavaScript or Java or Python to a server production. So, so sometimes we we don't have the 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 full or the big picture of the of what implies the bobs. I, I am not saying that just one single person is is going to do everything. Of course not. No, it's, <laughs> well, I mean it's almost impossible. <laughs> but that's the idea. Hey, Amber. <laughs> hey, that was such a great such a great presentation. I'm uh. I want to be mindful of our time, uh, but I want to thank you so much for 
really presenting this this concept in a unique and memorable way. Uh, so, yeah, that, it was really fantastic. And and I'm seeing that there are a few questions. Um, if people want to reach out to you and uh, want to continue the conversation, what what's going to be the best way that they can get in contact with you? Yeah, you can send me an email or I think in the last slide, I have the email. Perfect. Uh, give me a sec. Yeah, the, uh, and this is my, my Twitter handler, if you want. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, I, I really look forward to the continued conversation. And uh, again, I really appreciate you presenting this really valuable information <laughs> in a very memorable and applicable way. Um, so thank you so much for yeah spending the time to be here today. You're welcome. Um, if you have any question, comment, please reach me. This is my mail and I'm glad to help. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Alex. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your, what's today? Tuesday. Uh, have a good Tuesday. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch. <laughs> thank you very much. Good to see you. All right, everyone. We are moving on to our... Uh, moving on to an announcement by one of our sponsors. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward and hear a bit a bit of a word from our sponsors, and then we will move on to our next presentation. And now we want to say a huge thank you to one of our Platinum sponsors, Sysdig. So the Sysdig Security DevOps platform provides security to confidently run your containers, Kubernetes, and cloud. Secure your build detect and respond to threats and continuously validate cloud posture and compliance. Maximize performance of your product and availability to monitoring and troubleshooting cloud infrastructures and services. Sysdig is a SaaS platform built on the open source stack that includes Falco and Sysdig OSS. They open standards for runtime threat detection and responses. Hundreds of organizations rely on Sysdigs for security and visibility. To use their free trial, sign up via the link that we will post in the channel and uh, you can join right now and start for free. All right, thank you so much. That was a wonderful word. Uh, we really appreciate our sponsors that are helping this event happen uh, and be here. So please make sure to check them out. Uh, they really do play a vital part in this event. Okay, as we are moving forward to our next to last presentation of the day, uh, we have uh, Mr. Rodriguez here with us. He is a specific knowledge leader at NTT Data in Brazil. And he is going to tell us a bit about the magic of an, of a, of an open source REST-based test automation framework. So hello, Rick, how are you? Let's go ahead and add you in here. Hi, how are you doing today? Hi, Amber. Hi, Amber. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm fine, and you? I am doing well, doing well. Learning a lot from today and a real pleasure to be able to hear you speak. Me too, me too. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get you set up. Uh, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Just a second. Are you, are you seeing my screen? Okay, now we are seeing your screen. So I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. So it's a, a great honor to be here with you. And just a second, just to... First... I would like to present myself. My name is Rui Rodrigues. I'm from, from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm the father of an 11-year-old girl, and I'm married to a lovely girl. I'm a guitar player, not a professional one, not a great one, but I, I love music. I've been working with software development since uh, 1992, and I love it too. 
in the last 10 years, I've been focused on software quality from a technical point of view. And in the last six of these 10 years, I have exercised my passion for software quality at NTT Data Brazil. Initially, I was responsible for, responsible for test automation in the Americas. In the last two years, two years, I were responsible for the technical quality team in Brazil. So, I'm here to present you a new concept, one point of view on how to enable and embrace the diversity in the test automation process. Yes, a set of tools, but also a new global community focused on sharing innovative solutions to accelerate and enhance the test automation flow and results. It seems ambitious, ambitious, but in fact, you will see that makes sense. What is our current scenario? In the current days, the test automation is the bread and butter of the QA processes. I'm not saying that there is no space for a good session of, of exploratory tests. I'm saying that the current, currently needed speed of delivery can only be achieved with adequate support of automated tests. Fortunately, we have several good tools, especially on the layer of automation that drives the system under test. They all have strengths and weaknesses. Some are more focused on specific scenarios and some, some are more generalist. Here I'm talking about tools like uh, Selenium, Apium, Cypress, Robot Framework, Playwright, Postman, Newman, Tosca, UFT1, UFT Developer, and there are much more. This is very good. This diversity is very good. In parallel, we have also the Agile culture, reinforcing the liberty of the teams to select the best tools and process for their needs. This is good also, very good. But as a consequence of this scenario, we have a, a, a complex ecosystem and a, a complex flow of QA information. Frequently, we have different tools participating in the, in the automation flow and QA governance, sometimes for the same activity, but uh, in different teams with different needs. So this leads us to, first, more difficulties in summarizing QA information. We have data, data flowing from various sources, and it is common to have specific ways to ingest, to deal with the, the test information on each of these sources. And this leads us to test management tools that there are not effectively, effectively fed with the results generated in the test execution process. <clears throat> uh, here we have tools like ALM Obtain, ALM, X-Ray with Jira, Qmetry on Jira, Silk Central, Test Link, and all of them not fulfilling their, their potential because we cannot ingest all the information. This leads us to executive and tactical teams that are not being fed with all information about the QA process. And this leads us to, to the perception that there is a space for a new category of tools that enables integration of this ecosystem. This is Presto, okay? So Presto is a test automation framework, yes, but not a generic one. Uh, it, it doesn't try to uh, substitute the other tools that I commented before, but uh, uh, instead of it, uh, he's 
target is to integrate all of them. So Presto is an open source set of tools to exchange solutions and generate synergy. It is also a repository of plugins focused on integration so we can use what exists and share new creations. It is built primarily upon REST APIs because uh, our focus is integration and the, the REST APIs offer great integration qualities. It is an enabler, enabler to make your information flow smoothly, breaking the integration barriers and getting different tools to work together. It is also, it is also an invite to collaborate. As I said previously, we want to create a synergy on QA solutions everywhere. It is also a community of technical QA people sharing solutions. More than solutions shared, we would like to share ideas and approximate people. It is also a set of patterns to enable new solution creation using proven co concepts. At the end, it can be whatever your process needs if we can write the solution for your need as a REST service. Uh, the sky is the perceivable limit, but I, I don't see it as a, an end limit. Okay, but we are talking uh, abstractly. What we, do we have concretely today? We have five main parts that are, are ready to be used. We have a REST service that works uh, uh, as a data source on the test automation process. So we have a, a Python service that is configurable through uh, uh, a test, text file that uh, uh, leads the, the, the service to the database where are our information. And after initialized, uh, after, for each request that is sent to the service, uh, it will deliver one record of input data to be processed. So we can uh, manage several instances of, of testing of tests running together. And it doesn't matter how much or, or uh, what is the type of these, these instances of test, because it doesn't matter for the service, okay? We have also a REST service that receives and stores the test results. Uh, the target of this service is to make the, the, our results permanent and persistent. So we can, in the future, for example, feed a, a, a machine learning process with our test results and generate uh, predictions about the, the future of the executions. Okay. We have also an example dashboard generating visualizations on our test execution based on the database that is being fed by this REST service, okay? This is uh, uh, a Grafana dashboard uh, that can be cus uh, customized to generate other visions of the, this result. We have also a web application that filters explorers and permits visualizing and evaluating the test executions. So we can select uh, uh, periods of time and statuses. For example, I would like to see uh, only uh, the, the executions that occurred in the last hour and that are, are registered with the status of failed. We can see them and uh, uh, look in detail for each one of them, okay? We have also 
templates for Java GUI test, tests and Python API tests that reads data from Presto, reads input data from Presto, and store the results in the REST service. Okay. Very well. This diagram pictures what I will show you running uh, uh, on a video in, in the sequence. But uh, this is the, the use case that we are uh, showing you. We have a system under test that is a, a simple one. We have one API that is being consumed by, by a, a web application. This is in the, the blue box, the system under test. We have also the test layer, the test automation layer, the test script layer, uh, in, in which we have one script exercising the web application and another script exercising the API. Both of them are consuming data from the data source from Presto. This red box is what we are calling Presto, okay? So both of them are consuming data, data from the, the, the REST data source. If both of them and both of them are storing their results, are sending their results to the results register. As uh, uh, we have commented, the results register stores his data on a database that can be consumed by dashboards, from which we have one example, and that can also be consumed by an application that permits some fine-grained control about what is, is going on with our execution. We have, outside of these three boxes, three components that we uh, would like to comment also. Uh, the data that is being consumed by the REST data source was generated by a Python script. It could be a, a selection from data, of data from a, a, a database in, in homologation in, in the test environment, could be a, a, a data transformed from using a TDM solution. So uh, there are lots of possibilities when talking about the, the input data. So we are not considering this part of the, the, the Presto solution, okay? Another point that is registered here uh, uh, after this dotted arrow uh, is that we can send also the data to a test management management tool. This is one of the objectives, one, one of the targets of Presto, but this is not ready yet. So uh, this is in, in our backlog, but uh, seems to us that makes sense focus first on the, the, the database because of the, the possibility that we have commented a few minutes ago that uh, of using this data to feed uh, a machine learning, so learning solution that would be of great value. So I would like to, to show you the video running. The full video has 25 minutes, but we will accelerate it to you. Just a second. Do you see 
the video running. Oh, I hope so. So I am unable to see the video. Oh, it looks like it's working. Okay, thank you very much. So just a second. First, we are going to start the infrastructure needed to run Presto. What is this infrastructure? We have the WSL on my machine. We are using Docker to, to run two containers that are going to run one container with MariaDB that we will start now. Just a second. We are starting the container with our database. And now we are starting a container with Grafana. Now that we have the infrastructure up, we are going to start the system under, the, under test, both the API and the web application. This batch file will start both of them. So we have the application called Calculator, that is the web application, and another more that is the uh, Calculator service. Both of them were developed as examples in, in Python using Flask. So we have our system to be tested running. Next step is to put Presto running. We have the web application that explores the, the details, the results. We have the results register that is called store executions. And we have the data source service. All of them are developed on Python. Okay. Now that we have the infrastructure, the application, and Presto running, we can run our tests. We are going to start two types of test. Let me pause it. We, uh, as I said some minutes before, we have uh, some tests running a web application, and we have some tests running an API. We have two instances of the, the script that runs the web application and three instance, instances of the test of the API running. Let's see them starting. The web application is a playwright test developed in Java that we are starting with Maven. And the API tests are being executed uh, uh, as a Python script with no specific uh, test automation structure. We are uh, uh, just running it as, uh, as a loop consuming the data, okay? So we have both the API tests and the web tests running.
now we can see first our, our dashboard that is showing the visualization of the data being, being generated. Okay, so we already have 1,323 tests of API and five of the web application. This block on the left is focused on the, the API tests. This block on the right, the web application the test of the web application. Here we have the summary of both of them. And here on the top, we have the total execution. Sorry. Now we are going to see the web application that is showing us the executions that have already been registered we can filter them. We have a total of 3,746 executions that were run in this period of time. And we are seeing both statuses. So uh, we have passed and failed results. Okay. Now we have filtered just the failed results. Just a second, they are here. We have two failed results that have already occurred. In fact, we have a total of uh, 50,000 records of input data. And in this, uh, among these, we have 14 tests that have pointed uh, that will fail because the result, the expected result is incorrect. Okay. Uh, this information we have, uh, we have got the, the, this, the application to this screen, clicking on the uh, execution ID that is in the, the previous screen. Now we can see information about the execution that failed. So we have a test case ID, a test suite ID, the platform in which it is being executed, the date of execution, the execution time of this test, the status that is failed, and the comments that are being generated in the process of the of testing. We have also a, a snapshot of the screen of the, the application showing the expected result was 1.6563, and the result that was generated was 1.6562. So we have a difference here because of it, the test failed. But in the case of the API, what are we generating as as a, an evidence? Here it is. The JSON that is being generated is being put here as an evidence. Okay. So I will advance the video. Oh, this is an interesting point. I have changed the, the vision for the last 15 minutes so we can see the evolution of the execution minute by minute. for 
live executions, this is very interesting. But I'm going to move to the end of the process. Oops, just a second. Sorry. So we are moving to the end of the execution. As I said, we have 50,000 registers as input data. Uh, these 50,000 records were processed in uh, 25 minutes. And we have found the 14 failed executions that I have commented to you. Okay, we can see here minute by minute the amounts of execution that is between 125 and 150 records for the web application and between 2,000 and 2,500 executions by minute on the API. The 14 failed. We have all the passes here, and we can see several pages of execution. Okay. So let me finish the video, just a second. Let me bring back the last pages of the execution of the, the presentation. So what we expect in the future for Presto? We expect to continue focused on the quality of the QA process, fostering and instigating the rise of new enablers and getting closer to the development and operations. We are expecting to enable running on unfriendly environments, enabling a pattern of authentication and authorization to access the services part of Presto. We recommend the utilization of uh, uh, API Gateway to enhance the, the security. But uh, uh, we also think, also think that uh, uh, a process of authentication and authorization is necessary. We expect to share the exi existing and the new solutions on an open repository accessible by all the QA community. The repository is this one. You can access all the, the, the source code of everything I've, I've shown you. Let me show you. Just a second. This is our repository. GitHub.com slash R U I R R O D R I slash Presto. And thank you very much for your presence, being allowed to, to talk to you. You can access me at this address. Just a second, Just let me. This is my work email address, rui.lopes.rodrigues 
at entitydata.com. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. That was some really valuable information and uh, really a great way to, uh, I know we have one more session after this, but uh, a good way to end us off as we are uh, taking, having our takeaways from the day. So thank you for the, your time and for sharing your valuable expertise. Thank you very much, Amber. You have a good rest of the day. Have a good rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are uh, moving into our final presentation. But before we do that, we have one last word from our sponsors. So let's go ahead and move on to that video. And then we will uh, introduce our final presentation for the evening. As a developer, you need to deliver fast and you simply don't have the time to constantly think about security. Neurolegion can help. We give you, the developer, comprehensive and fast security testing automation for your entire application on every pull request. With every new pull request, Nexploit will run all the security tests your app needs without false positives. We can integrate directly with your CI, CD pipelines, whatever your environment. So what are you waiting for? Add Nexploit to your project and start doing unit security testing today. All right, uh, that was our final word from our sponsors. Again, our sponsors have a very big impact on these events. Uh, they're a huge part of why they happen. So uh, make sure to check them out. All right, we are going into our final presentation of the day, of our day one. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, today has been a lot of information. I hope that you've been able to take a lot of notes and uh, connect with other people that are within this community. Uh, as we're going into our final presentation, it will be pre-recorded uh, from uh, Sebashish. Uh, he is a Agile and QA Ops lead at British Telecom. And we're going to be learning about cognitive continuous testing with a next-gen approach. So there is a lot of valuable information. I know we've had a lot of information throughout the day. Uh, please um get out your pen and notepads. Uh, this is our final chance to get some really valuable information that you can take back to your team today. So let's go ahead and start that final video. And um, I think we are good to go. Thank you. Family are doing well. I am Subhashish Patnaik, working as Agile and QA Ops Specialist here at British Telecom in India. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Geekle.us for providing a global stage for the software testers around the world. Now, it is an honor for me to be able to share the transformation journey we undertook at British Telecom. Now, BT as an organization has an extraordinary history of innovation. Now, we work on as old as mainframes to newly born systems or latest based angular based systems. We cater to age old copper connections to latest ultra fiber and 5G networks. Now, today I am going to take you through our cognitive journey towards continuous testing. Now, what is continuous testing? Does it ring some bell? Yes. When we plug testing into DevOps cycle, we call it continuous testing. Now, artificial intelligence in DevOps is revolutionizing IT. Now, DevOps is an approach to deliver software with higher quality and at great speed. AI is a technology used to integrate the systems for enhanced functionality. Now together, this is effective, efficient, and faster. Cognitive continuous testing is an in-house AI powered model design and orchestration tool that helped us achieve a cost saving of roughly around 300 kg pounds per year. Now let's talk about the background. Artificial intelligence technologies extend the capability of software applications that are now found throughout our daily life. Now DevOps added with AI or ML has the potential to stabilize and streamline the model release process. It is often paired with practice and tool set to support CI, CD, and CT. Now there are two effective ways of combining AI based tool and DevOps in testing. Now, the first one is continuous testing. As we know, one of the most crucial phases in DevOps cycle, testing requires precision, attention to detail, and proficient validity. 
the lack of efficiency in software testing makes it the perfect case of AI. The ability to AI to spot differences in the most complex settings enable developers to manifold testing frequency and quality. Under DevOps, continuous testing involves automatic execution of software testing with no lag results and better software quality and instant feedback generation. Now, the second approach was test design techniques. It is a very crucial and a vital step for enabling faster, effective, and an efficient model for continuous testing to run. This means we need to be agile and adaptable to the changing methods and demands for achieving higher and better quality, and hence cognitive continuous testing. Now let's talk about the goal of cognitive CT. Combination of cognitive continuous testing and our in-house AI-powered tool, Cognitive, makes it efficient and effective for the entire process. Our objective is to bring the AI flavor to continuous testing ecosystem. Now, what exactly is cognitive continuous testing? Cognitive continuous testing is an intelligent test planning and orchestration tool which automates the most humanly possible activity in testing. Automation is the need of the R, and in testing, it has special importance. In the age of digital era, it is very important to have as much as automation possible in every phase of testing, right from your requirement design till go live for a faster product delivery of the product into market, that is continuous testing. Traditional and open source automation tools help in reducing the time required to test, but options are limited when the question is what to test. Now, one quick answer is to test everything, but on a practical need basis. It is not possible due to the time constraint and it is also not economical. Hence, there is a need of smart and enhanced model that can comb through the changes and give you a very accurate set of test cases to run. The objective of cognitive computing system is to identify the scenarios, analyze the impact, the change on the existing functionality and come up with scenarios or test cases for execution. We call it ECT, Elementary Comparison Test, by using a self-learning system that uses data mining, pattern recognition, and natural language processing, and applying predictive intelligence to give the best possible test cases with ranking and prioritization. Now let's talk about the goals that we want to achieve by adopting cognitive continuous testing. Now we wanted to achieve 30% reduction in test execution time. That's pretty much huge. Avoid emotional decision making that involves a lot of humans, right? We, we as human, we do have quite a lot of emotional decision making coming into place. Test early in the cycle. We want to make testing as early as possible with the shift left approach. Automate everything. Continuous feedback, that's very important. And last but not the least, deliver in small increments and experiment frequently without any regret. Now, our methodology and resources used in Cognitive CT. We have developed an in-house tool to enable process automation in each phase of DevOps cycle. In a broad view, the whole Cognitive Continuous Testing is developed to cater the smart automation needs, primarily for three important aspects of testing. The first aspect is test planning with cognitive continuous testing. Now, cognitive is implemented in the test planning, which has self-learning capabilities. Cognitive has built on the data lake architecture powered by ML and NLP. Now, how are all these things are working in tandem? Now, there are two things here. First is building the test model by reverse engineering. Now, we do a lot of reverse engineering of the existing test matrix using NLP the natural language processing, test scenarios, test cases, the specifications, XMLs and attributes mapped to the test specifications are processed in a huge data lake that's powered by Hadoop and a natural language processor and a full fledged test models are built on runtime. The second aspect to this is once the models are built, we apply our highly enhanced ranking and prioritization logic, which is sitting on top of a self learning algorithm or we call it as modified condition decision coverage, MCDC. This tool 
aggregates the data from production and test environment, synthesizes it in a platform like Hadoop, where the daily size of this data is roughly around 750 GB to produce a consumption analytics. Now, this data is then sourced into recurrent neural networks to perform ranking and prioritization on the test cases. Now here, we would be seeing a very, very high level architecture of what exactly cognitive continuous testing is all about. Now, if you see here, as cognitive receives a request from a CI CD tool like Jenkins in likes of Bamboo, the tool would eventually suggest tests based on the change deployed. Now the data is fetched based from the CR management layer by performing a dynamic risk-based testing on the earned confidence of the change by dynamically applying machine learning and a predictive algorithm that is the recurrent nlp this set of test patch is then fed into the orchestrator now hence cognitive helps us in preparing the test plan in a more intelligent structural and a systematic way at ease also avoids human errors and knowledge churn in the organization also we use this tool to pull the planned tests into software test management tool for a future execution and closure. Now the capability, as we discussed, the goals that we wanted to achieve with cognitive continuous testing and a reduction of overall test planning process, which is roughly around some 28.87%. Now this has also helped us in improving our defect density by approximately 10 to 11%. Now additional goals or benefits, now, reducing non-filling test cases approximately roughly around 27%. Now, redundancy in test planning and test execution has also been reduced, improved the test planning efficiency, and the capability has been proven and efficiency of circa 200 kgbp per year to 300 kgbp per year. Now, how Cognitive gets the scripts automated? Now, there is an element of script automation that comes into picture. The automation development engine is the conglomeration of industry standard licensed and open source tool. Most of the systems are automated using tools like Selenium, open source tools like Selenium. The apps and web portals developed in the latest technologies like HTML5 and AngularJS are automated using Node.js, using Protractor and Nightwatch frameworks. We also did a substantial amount of automation in iOS device using APM which has helped app-based products roll out faster. All automated scripts are mapped with the test scenarios or the cases and are saved into a centrally cognitive continuous testing servers. More details around this are like how the Selenium framework is defined, a hybrid framework that is created by combining quite a lot of features of different types, like a module-based and a test-driven data framework. It uses a page object model or famously known as the POM model methodology to define or to better maintain the scripts. Now these scripts are used for automated scheduling and report generation as well. The mobile testing framework, the project has leveraged APM capability using the APM Studio for automation of the client specific apps on iOS devices. APM is an open source tool as we all know for automating native mobile and hybrid application, iOS, Android based platforms. A project has repository of roughly around um, tentatively 500 to 600 odd scripts which are used for regression on ios devices in each release now considering what exactly reporting and test execution helps or comes into picture with cognitive continuous testing now continuous testing or cognitive continuous testing is also an automated test scheduling tool for an unattended test execution over the virtual private cloud infra now, post the check-in, our CICD tool sends a trigger, which is received for a continuous testing. And based on the change getting deployed, a smart intelligent batch is scheduled for execution on respective environment. Automated scripts are executed on the VPC running Docker containers. Testing capabilities of cognitive continuous testing is not limited to system or regression, but also extended to performance, security, and visual testing. Cognitive CT employs a listener mechanism, which helps to identify the server details, which is free for execution. It will create a queue of all the automated tests from and allocates each of any server available during the runtime. 
and that's how we enhance or that's how we uh, are able to get a parallel execution benefit and which also results in a faster throughput now you must be wondering what were the challenges that we had to overcome to achieve all this the challenges like a global expansion with existing legacy platform now we wanted to go to market in every two weeks or less rather i would say and establishing a secure and a robust automated infrastructure continuous secure delivery pipelines inconsistent and unreliable releases and a high percentage of post production defects these were some of the challenges that we had to come across and overcome or mitigate in terms to achieve whatever the benefits i just had highlighted for cognitive ct now talking about some quantifiable outcomes that cognitive ct has allowed or helped us achieve our 30% reduction in overall timeline of devops pipeline 100% automated prioritization of test cases through analytics 100% automated scheduling and execution or we call it as zero touch and 100% capability with dev design and devops test plan so these are some of the quantifiable benefits and also as per the dora model we are also publishing quite a lot of analytics or or kpis are being measured and captured that was all about cognitive ct so if you have got a question regarding cognitive ct feel free to hit me up qa session and i will be happy to take it up thank you here i am <laughs> sorry i was I was covered up. Thank you so much for that final presentation of the day. That was fantastic. So I cannot believe it, but we are already at the end of the day of learning. Uh, there has been so much great information that has been shared. We have a whole nother day of, lean, of learning tomorrow. Uh, if you want to join us for day two of the event, that would be fantastic. But as for me uh, and my hosting, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us today, investing in your professional development so that we can really uh, that, that we can really have a fantastic time or so that we can be very intentional to really build the future. Uh, it looks like we have a few people that are going to join us for a QA. and a um, I am looking to see where looks like we may have some people ready to join our Q&A. Not seeing anyone just yet. Um but we do have a yeah, Amber, I guess yeah. like uh, the speakers are joining or I don't know. <laughs> because, yeah, Rui is here actually. He's getting back. <laughs> so I, I also got, I started to get a bit worried because yeah, we have a QA. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome back, Sorry, Rui. I didn't see anyone. All right, looks like we have some people coming back. Okay. Hello, hello. Hello, Amber. Nice to have you with us. Um, I am pulling up a few of the questions here. So it looks like you are, um, it, it looks like you're the only one here for our Q&A. So this is great. We'll have more of a, uh, more of a specific conversation. Um, so okay. I am pulling up some of the questions that are here. Um, so these are all slightly different questions. So I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you this one. Uh, do you believe that having an extensive TA on non, uh, on non product code as in performance, security, accessibility, testing, running in CI on DevOps infrastructure code, uh, it sounds good, but really, rarely do companies do that. What, what are your thoughts on that question slash insight? I think that it is fundamental to have uh, test automation on non-product code and to uh, uh, follow the quality of what is being generated before it runs on production. This is the, the, the bread and butter of our, our 
quality science, let's say in this way. Uh, I think that, uh, yes, I, I believe, and it is fundamental to have agility and uh, uh, speed of delivery. Yeah, it, absolutely, absolutely. Having that speed of delivery. Um, and it looks like uh, we have a couple other questions here. Oh, hey, hey, Alex, how are you? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We are just going through some of the questions that came in through the chat. Um, so the next question that we have, oh, we have everyone here. Hello, now it's a party. <laughs> now it's a party. You're going through some of the questions. Um, one of the questions that was asked, I'll pull this up. Uh, what are the advantages of using GitHub Actions against other CI tools like Circle CI or Jenkins? So uh, I can take that as that was my topic. So uh, it's mostly the fact that it integrates directly to your CI, uh, your uh, kit. So it, you get the, all of the results uh, in your pull request, in your code, in your kit. So you see everything or you're doing your normal actions because you go and review your friend's pull request or your co-worker's pull request. And you see it immediately there. Oh, it passed. Uh, so you don't have to have the integration working. As some of us know, <laughs> Jenkins integration doesn't always work. Circle CI integration, yeah, uh, it, it exists. Uh, sometimes it works. Um, uh, you can do these, but it works out of the box immediately. So no matter what, you basically have the integration tear. Shortly. And that, that does bring me to a, a follow-up question that we had, which was, GitHub Actions in cloud, how does that differ or does it differ from cloud to cloud? It differs, uh, like, uh, of course, it depends on how you do your uh, cloud infrastructure or cloud management. Uh, but uh, from cloud to cloud, I would say that uh, because in Azure, uh, you can also use Azure DevOps to deploy. <laughs> Let's not go in there, but uh, I I actually have a demo of Azure DevOps integrated with GitHub. So you deploy from GitHub to Azure DevOps, and Azure DevOps deploys everything, which is pretty cool. Uh, so it removes all of the user management, etc., because Azure DevOps manages all of that for you. Versus in AWS and uh, Google Cloud, you have to use the Azure uh, AWS client or uh, Google Cloud client, like I was showing, uh, and you have to have those. Uh, libraries installed on the image that you're using, but there is an action for that available. So uh, the way, version that I was showing during the presentation uh, doesn't differ that much, but there are a few other ways how Microsoft has made GitHub integrate better with Azure lately. So there is differences. Uh, I could probably talk a few hours about it, but uh, it was a 30 minute slot for beginners. So try to go uh, stay in the top level. And I want to I want to open it up to um, to our other guests. Do you have any insights on uh, insights on the difference between uh, GitHub or uh, sorry on GitHub in the cloud or cloud to cloud? Well, <clears throat> I, I can add that, but you know, GitHub and GitHub Actions are Microsoft products, so you know the integration is. Fantastic. It's highly achieved with Microsoft Azure, of course. So uh, Jenkins is, you know, if you have a project with Java, you know, this is like the way to go, you know, you, you, you add the end grade, Gradle. So, I mean, for Java projects, I think Jenkins is, is pretty transparent, you know, there is not a step curve to, to learn a lot. So, well, but you can use... You know, there, there is a explosion of tools. You, you have to see the, the, the Cloud Native Foundation. So, so there is a ton of tools. So I, I can, I, I can never seen a, a project with just one single tool. Well, mm -hmm. I, I like to use GitLab, <laughs> but you know, it's a DevOps platform. So instead of using like five or six different tools, the idea of just to learn one, just to use one, it's make appealing. So 
I, I'll, call your, I, I'll call your papu. It's not actually one in the be, be, below the hood, but it's one for user, which is the most important thing. And GitHub, GitHub is trying to do the same, I think. Yeah. They, they, are, they, they are moving, they are overlapping functions. So yeah, I think that they are moving like in the same direction, though, just yeah. to have the, the repository, the continuous integration deployment, well, on, you know, on the, on the production server. Yeah. I, I, uh, can I link somehow a link to the users? Because I have a version of the release for AVS, and that is uh, because it's one of our production code. It has 307 lines in it, so I don't want to really share my screen or anything for it, but just so they could look at it if they want. Mm -hmm. Or if they are interested, they can connect me, uh, connect to me somewhere else. So uh, I have uh, how we do an AVS deployment for a React application for serverless. So that's 307 lines in our uh, current uh, GitHub Actions pipeline. So it sounds like, um, yeah, m many tools that we can use. So it's not limiting to just one. No, it's never limited in one for DevOps. It's the uh, exactly. big picture of everything is the uh, every tool of DevOps and you cry yourself to sleep looking at it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I want to move on to uh, another question that we had. Um, so how do we compare normal testing and cognitive testing? Uh, how can we employ a mix and match of the two? That, that's a tough question. <laughs> I don't know. I pass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is a, it is a tough question. Is there a messy answer that, w or a messy response? <laughs> there are probably many messy answers to it. <laughs> we can see several, uh, um, several approaches to cognitive testing. We have several things, several different things that are being called cognitive testing. So uh, uh, it's not an easy one to, to answer. Uh, mm. We, uh, we uh, uh, are basically uh, talking about uh, the traditional testing versus the testing using machine learning and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And we have used machine learning and artificial intelligence in several fronts. We can use it to optimize our test cases, for example, to determine what, are, what test cases are more relevant. We can use it to uh, generate input data we can use it for several things. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it's important to keep an eye on, on what is possible to to use of the the, the new technologies that are uh, involving uh, artificial intelligence. Out of curiosity, because uh, cognitive testing is about how we see things. Uh, do you see UX testing as cognitive testing or testing, normal testing? So, because nowadays, for example, in Europe, we are doing a lot of UX testing because regulation requires that uh, public sector things are uh, UX tested so that they are accessible. So, which side of testing would that go? Can you repeat, please, your question? Uh, Sorry. So, in, uh, nowadays, we do a lot of accessibility testing, so UX testing. Do you have your uh, web page so that you can use keyboard uh, or can you use pet, uh, text to speech? for example. So would we see that as a normal testing or cognitive testing? Because it is related to your cognitive uh, reaction as a person, but yes. it is a normal testing in the sense of how we test. Yeah, I see this as an accessibility test that uh, that can use or not yeah. the, the artificial intelligence. Yeah. But, but I guess that you know, the, 
the maturity level of your debug practice is so high that you start doing cognitive testing. I mean, uh, just to automate testing is is a whole software project, so you need a lot of practice to keep things going. So just to reach this level of cognitive testing, I mean, you need a lot of expertise. I, I guess so. <laughs> I think that in the, the, the following months, we will have a, a more presence of the, the, these technologies on, on the market uh, because we have several things being developed, developed by the, the great ones. We have uh, Microsoft with uh, uh, visual recognition. We have uh, Oracle and Microsoft and, and Google talking about natural language processing. So uh, we can use these technologies that are not more, uh, uh, not rocket science anymore. We can use it in, in, in normal days uh, because they are uh, being generated uh, in, in another level that we can just use. So I think that it will be very common in, in Morpheus to have uh, visual recognition, to have uh, natural language processing in, in our uh, DevOps and quality processes. So th there is going to be another role, you know, if, if th there is another space for, I don't know, the AI ops engineer. Or, or who is going to do that? I mean, I think that uh, the the DevOps and quality role is changing. And yeah, this is part of the change. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of the nature of DevOps is that it is continuously changing. Um, <laughs> that's. A, a part of uh, a part of DevOps as a whole. Now, Kel, there was a question that was specifically for you, and uh, that question was, "What what is the exact thing that prevents an organization from stagnating into mediocrity using GitHub Actions?" Question mark. It's the fact that you're actually. Uh communicating already because uh, it's the same like how Andrew mentioned GitLab. So GitLab uses the uh, code reviews as a very heavy duty to do, tool to force you to communicate. And GitHub uses the same logic. So uh, when you build everything around your acceptance and approval process and change process, which is your pull request, uh, it's not possible to skip the process because it is already built into everything you're doing. So uh, you are continuously releasing because you're continuously using the tool. You're not uh, going somewhere. You're not hiding the data somewhere. You're not putting the, for example, code uh, review, uh, code scanning or something like that to a sonar cube. You're bringing it to your visual, uh, visually to where you're reviewing things. So it allows your team to constantly be and upgrading, changing, understanding where they are going next. Uh, basically, it forces you to towards more of the continuous deployment model. Uh, hopefully, most people would get there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> to quote my friend, we, we got CI in 90s, we got the CD, uh, first uh, continuous delivery if after that, uh, very big soon. And then we've been waiting for the continuous deployment in most companies because the, uh, there is someone waiting for the approval button that they have to press. Mm -hmm. And it gets a lot easier when you have something like uh, which is which is built in, like because you you have an approval process in most companies. Well, if it's if the approval is that hey, we are, I'm reading this uh, pull request and approving those, it becomes a lot easier to show we are managing the changes. It's not just that we are releasing. Any manager can see, oh, someone actually looked it through and approved that this change is uh, good. Absolutely. And also the fact that uh, current data development tools are developing a lot faster, allowing you to not spend time on talking Jenkins, as most companies shouldn't do. 
It's my job, though. But... <laughs> not, not a good job. <laughs> so I'm curious. So I do just want to let the fans or let the the fans, the uh, attendees know. You can be fans too. Um, <laughs> let the attendees know if you have any specific questions that you want to ask. Feel free to put them into the Q and A, uh, and then we can address those throughout this panel. Uh, but I I have a question. Uh, we've gone through a lot of different tools that we can use today. Uh, if I am someone that is joining a team or is a part of a team that is in the early adoption stage um, uh, of DevOps, what what are some action steps that I can take to be proactive to help that transition be uh, be smoother and to be more of a success? What are some action steps that I can take? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking like, uh, I, 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 if I say containers, that's kind of like, uh, it's a very simple answer. It's what everybody gives you. But it's the truth, like uh, lots of things are running on top of containers nowadays. Like uh, we were talking about the AI uh, and machine learning stuff. A lot of the tools that those people, uh, like my wife is a, a data scientist, so she works with, uh, I have to teach her how to do Docker nowadays because a lot of the tools are built around that you do, do Docker things. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the tooling that we do nowadays that we are using relies on containers. So you should really understand how that works because uh, servers nowadays we deploy containers if we look at Azure, AVS and Google Cloud. You're not deploying uh, any more code directly, <laughs> even though it's serverless. You're deploying containers most likely. Uh, so I would say that knowing containers makes a lot life a lot easier. I would complement talking about the infrastructure as code. Yeah, com combined with containers, it, it is a very powerful tool to, to make the things work. I think that before learning any tool, Docker, containers, Kubernetes, etc., you have to learn about the whole idea, the big picture of the, about the communication, about DevOps, about the. I think that this is a. <clears throat> I mean, even before I start learning, you know, the Docker command. So, of course, we have to learn about that, but the way that we are going to communicate the advantage of this whole DevOps culture. If we don't get this, I mean, if the company, if you don't have the stakeholder support and the whole team is involved with that, I mean, I think that the, the tool, it's you can use GitHub, Actions, Jenkins, any tool, and it's going to be the same, but the idea of have this lubricated machinery is, is, is the most important thing, well, at least for me. I don't know if that answered a little bit the question. Because, well, for, for me, that that's, will be the, the, the first approach to someone new on, on the team. So, so what to understand it. So there is this great book, the, the Phoenix Project. Maybe you have ever mm -hmm. heard about it. This is like the Bible of the bots. So, so if you are starting your career uh, on the bots, this is the this is a must. If we go one step below that, Alejandro, I, I think one thing that is often like nowadays looked down is the standard software uh, decree, like any decree where you learn the basics of software development, uh, like uh, going through and learning what is uh, what is high availability, what is networking, what is uh, algorithms. All of that comes back to bite you when you don't learn that. Uh, like I'm all in for the accessibility of IT becoming through the boot camps, etc. But like all of the skills that you learn during during going through the universities, etc., those are actually useful in most cases. Uh, Microsoft Access is not useful. So if you're learning databases through Microsoft Access, that's not useful. Like that's how <laughs> at least in Finland they teach. So that's not. <laughs> but like many of the things are very useful when you actually come to the job life. You just have to know how to use the theory in practice. And that's a hard thing. But going down from the like, yes, uh, culture, speaking about things and 
understanding that removing silos is the number one thing in DevOps. I think yeah. that both of you have commented the, the key word that is culture. Culture is the, the key point of DevOps. Uh, the tools are important. They are, as Alex said very well, the lubricant of the process, but uh, uh, they are not the process. The, the, the culture is the process. The culture supports the process. Embrace the favor. It's the it's what I I always tell my team sure. that like we need to embrace the failure like that happens we can't prevent it. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the human ops, no, the, the, the human ops, is like another side of the DevOps that some sometimes we don't. Well, you know, we are developers, we are CSS means, so we we don't talk too much about that, but it's, it's really important, no, the, the soft skills, communication. So, so that's uh, at least for me. I think that this is a, a, a pretty important part of the, of the DevOps. That we, we like to code, we, we like to to type commands, but you know, to communicate, to know what and how to measure things is, is really important. And so, sometimes we don't realize about that, or we don't care. So, what's acceptable, what is not? If, if we get a bug on production, you know the you know the, the whole metrics so so this is pretty important at least for me we, we can always learn docker or any other technology so well <laughs> you know i i like what you said about human ops or even people ops it's it's so um fascinating that even a lot of hr places today they'll they've changed the names to people ops. So they've drawn in inspiration yeah. from DevOps and <laughs> uh, really seeing the value uh, that DevOps provides. Yeah, well, you know, Agile and, and DevOps is, are, are overlapping, you know? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And then the whole idea of DevOps is, you know, going on to production, but you are making Agile, you are, well, they, they are a good fit because, you know, it's like the same idea of, of getting a product and minimum viable product as fast as possible with quality, transparency. And and, that, and that's it's the whole idea of DevOps. I mean, it's, it's like an extension DevOps of, of Agile. So, so, yeah, of course, the tools are important. The automation, you know, cognitive or now, the automation of testing is very important. But this is something that, I mean, the DevOps is uh is day by day. So so when you go to like maybe five years of practice, you are going to talk about cognitive and other types of testing. So so what I mean it's little by little. Is 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 every day you have to deal with several issues, several um so the practice is going to be better. So so I think that at this point I um, at certain point, you are going to be there automating everything. And it's just like, just a commit and there you go. No? We have a new system on production. So, so but it's not, not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> Hopefully, but not. Absolutely. I like what you said about really, really just understanding what DevOps is from, from a 3,000, you know, 30,000 foot view, you have to understand the overall picture um, before you can get into the nitty gritty of, the, of those tools. Uh, but the two do go hand in hand. We know the big picture and then we can uh, really focus on what tool is going to be most effective uh, in, in every situation that we encounter. Yeah, so, so sometimes you, you don't decide which tool you are going to use is like a corporate decision or because they have an agreement or something like that they, because they use java and they have to use jenkins and, and sometimes it's like that so, but i mean it's not that that important in my whole opinion so just to understand how to make good server and get to like the whole idea no what is ci if it's not glorified cron job like it's it's a glorified cron job if you think about it. Like it it, ha it it runs on a schedule. It might be triggered by a something else, but uh, yeah, there is a, most likely a fast script which you have made better. 
thank God it's not a pass script nowadays, but yeah. So yeah, it's it's like you can do the DevOps without the tools, but you can't do uh, DevOps without the culture. That's it. Sure. Well, it looks, I, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to come back, uh, giving your presentation, but also coming back for this, this panel discussion. Um, these are all the questions that I see here, but before we leave, I want to give an opportunity for you, uh, for anyone to share some final takeaways uh, that we can use as we are uh, ending off this first day of learning. Are there any final comments, sly remarks, insights? <laughs> I think that there is a point that we can't uh, not mention. That is the, the changing of the market, the changing of the roles. It is fundamental to, to see and to recognize it. So uh, uh, I think that when uh, uh, a junior professional ask us, asks us what to learn, I would recommend to uh, keep an eye open to know the basis and continue, continue to see what is changing and why. Mm -hmm. I think that this is the, the main point today. That's really powerful. Yeah. So, well, I, I think that like a final quote is the, the world needs more DevOps. So there is a very exciting moment. So if you are thinking about becoming a DevOps engineer, this is the moment. We don't even know who is a DevOps engineer. I, I don't know. Well, I, I was a developer. Now it's supposedly that I am a DevOps engineer. I, I really don't know. <laughs> I, I, want to, I, I can continue from there. There is no such thing as DevOps engineer <laughs> in perfect word. DevOps engineer is a developer and an operations, both You're working together. Like if we if we could do DevOps as humans in the QA, yeah, yeah, and uh, and and the business owner and uh, like everybody in the organization would be part of the software development. You would have a UX researcher. You would yeah. Let's not go listing everybody, but the point is that if we can do DevOps perfectly, there would be no need for DevOps engineer. Center of Excellence for DevOps, any of the amazing things that we add in our organizations. But those are needed to push the DevOps forward, the culture. Because mm -hmm. it's about removing silos between all of the blockers and making things more lean, basically. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. So anyone with the curiosity and the energy can become a DevOps engineer. No matter if you are a developer, a CSS mean, a database administrator, I mean, <laughs> well, that, that's the way that I see it. The job market might see it a bit different, we hope, but <laughs> just <laughs> from the point of view of what we spread as a DevOps, uh, we say, uh, we, we like to say that it's, and it is what we expect happen. Yeah. Well, it sounds like this is the right place to be. Um, DevOps is the right place to be. If you want a place to grow, a place to truly create the future, uh, that's really what we're doing here is we are creating the future. And uh, it's a really exciting time to be a part of this, a part of this industry. And there is ample opportunity to grow. And uh, one thing that really drew me personally to the DevOps community uh, at the very beginning was just how welcoming the community is, um, very open to discussion and learning. So uh, this is this is the community to be in and it's the industry to be in. Uh, and speaking of community, again, I just wanna thank uh, all three of you for spending some extra time today to share your insights, uh, share some very valuable insights that we can take back to our job, and then also share a bit of uh, inspiration that we can take back as well. Uh, that we can apply to to our positions. So uh, really do appreciate you giving back to the community and really investing in the people that 
are here today. So thank you so much. Very honored to be here. Thank, thank you. you for the thank space. You. Bye. Bye. Oh, Alex. There you go. <laughs> All right, everyone. And with that, uh, what a wonderful way to end off our session for today. Uh, just with some really, again, valuable insights and some inspiration that we can take back as we go back to our uh, go back to our jobs and, again, really do create the future. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, we have a whole nother day of learning tomorrow. Uh, but as for me, my name is Amber Vandenberg, and it has been an absolute joy and honor to spend this afternoon evening, morning, wherever you are in the world, uh, but to spend this day with you all. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, we will see everyone again tomorrow.